In the pantheon of the video games that holds the greatest and most legendary franchises to have ever existed, Resident Evil has remained unmoved for ages. Through ups and downs, this is a series that has reinvented itself time and time again, and has provided numerous experiences that rank among not only the greatest of its genre, but of the entire industry as a whole. And while things such as level design, atmosphere, and its knack for producing primal scares in players have always been hallmarks of the franchise, the narrative it has woven over the course of dozens of games is also something that has endeared itself to millions of people. No, it's not the perfect story and has been prone to flights of extremely corny fantasy a few too many times. But in the grand scheme of things, over the years, Resident Evil managed to craft a winding and engrossing story. In this multi-part feature, we'll be taking a long and detailed look at the story of Resident Evil. Without further ado then, let's get started. Before we get started and jump into the events of Resident Evil Zero, the first canonical game in the series, let's take a few moments to, as always, set up some of the events in the history of the series' timeline that will go on to define much of what happens. There's going to be plenty to talk about before we even get to the events portrayed in the very first chronological game itself, so buckle in. The one name you'll see coming up in Resident Evil more than any other is Umbrella. It all begins with Umbrella. So what exactly is Umbrella? Well, to answer that question, we first need to jump back a few years, all the way back to 1962, where we look at three integral characters who will, in more ways than one, go on to shape the vast majority of the events that transpire in many Resident Evil games through their actions. Dr. Oswell E. Spencer, Dr. Edward Ashford, and Dr. James Marcus. It begins when the three young scientists gain information on a wildflower called Stairway of the Sun that grows in a very specific area of West Africa. The flower, it is said, bestows powers and superhuman capabilities to all those who consume it. After the three scientists do some digging around, they draw from this myth a scientific hypothesis, that the flower is the cause of a mutagenic viral infection, caused by a virus inside of it, which they go on to dub the progenitor virus, which in turn leads to what, according to the local folklore, are powers. The three of them believe that the flower can be used to create an improved and superior form of humans. When they attempt to cultivate the flower back in the United States, though, they find that their attempts are resulting in constant failure. The flower, it seems, needs very specific conditions to be able to grow properly. Spencer, Ashford, and Marcus realize that they're going to need a lot of funding if they want to continue their research. And the solution to their dilemma turns out to be Umbrella. Spencer, with his two partners, decides to set up a pharmaceutical company, Umbrella Corporation, so that they can use the money that they make from that to keep funding their research. They have a few other irons in the fire as well, however. Spencer, Ashford, and Marcus decide to also keep selling their products of their research, those being bioorganic weapons, or BOWs, to the United States military. Weaponizing a virus sounds like a terrible idea, no matter how you frame it, but clearly the trio does not care. They make a lot of money from selling their progenitor virus to the military, money which they can use to keep their research going. Spencer takes that money and makes heavy investments with it. He builds an entire lab for himself in the Arklay Mountains, just outside of the Midwestern Raccoon City. On top of his lab, he issues the construction of an elaborate mansion, one full of traps and a labyrinthian design, all of which existed for the purposes of keeping his lab, and as such his work, safe and hidden. Later on, he would invite George Trevor, the architect of the mansion, and his family, his wife Jessica and their daughter Lisa, to the mansion under the pretext of celebrating the construction of the mansion. As the word pretext may have probably given it away, Spencer would go on to kill both George and Jessica, wanting to make sure that no one other than him can know the complete ins and outs of the mansion. And Lisa, well, we'll get to her later. Spencer's devilish machinations, as this incident demonstrated, begin to take ugly shapes. By now, Spencer, Ashford, and Marcus, in spite of having been once partners, have essentially become fierce competitors of each other. They've all been conducting independent research on the progenitor virus, and have been involved in what is essentially an arms race against one another. In 1968, under mysterious circumstances, an accident orchestrated by Spencer, Ashford is exposed to the progenitor virus and dies and is survived by his son, who is a geneticist, Alexander Ashford. There's a bucket load of stuff that goes on with Alexander and the Ashford family, but we'll be talking about that in great detail later, so keep this tucked away in the back of your mind for now. 
For now, let's jump forward all the way to 1978, a year which is quite significant in the history of Resident Evil. Why? Well, by this time, Dr. Marcus has spent roughly a decade doing research on the virus, and has now finally managed to make a breakthrough. Combining the virus with leech DNA, Marcus creates a new mutation of it, the T-Virus, a much deadlier bioweapon. While the progenitor virus was one that would kill those who got infected by it, the T-Virus functions in a different way thanks to its mutations. It keeps those infected alive in a mentally damaged state and turns them into violent and cannibalistic animals who function at those capacities and those capacities only after the virus causes a cardiac arrest. Translation, it turns them into zombies. Marcus didn't do this alone, however. He accomplished this task with the help of two young researchers he had recently taken under his wing. A brilliant young scientist named Dr. William Birkin and a promising researcher named Albert Wesker. As Spencer takes note of Marcus's accomplishments, he grows wary. The fierce competition between the two has persisted even now in spite of the fact that both of them remain in high leadership positions at Umbrella, and he begins to take steps to make sure that Marcus isn't able to overthrow or outpace him. Let's pause here and spend just a little bit of time talking about Albert Wesker and his past, because he's a character who's going to be extremely important for a large chunk of this series. When he was a child, he, among many others, was collected by Umbrella on account of having superior and more intelligent genes. For what purpose was Umbrella doing this, though? Well, as you might remember, the reason Spencer even began his research into the virus all of those years ago was so that he could use its effects to create a superior species of humans. These children were to be Spencer's test subjects. The head of this program, called Project W, was one Dr. Wesker, after whom Spencer not only named the program, but even all of the children who were a part of it. All these children, after their abductions, were kept in controlled environments by Spencer, who ensured that they received the best education and qualifications, but also ensured that they were constantly brainwashed and indoctrinated with his own philosophies. All the Wesker children would be injected with a prototype virus, but only very few of them would ever survive. 93% of them would succumb to the virus. Among these children, Spencer found that the most promising was Albert Wesker. It was then no surprise, when he turned 17 in 1977, he joined up with Umbrella as one of its prodigious researchers. Now, back to the story at hand. Following the advancements that Marcus has made, Spencer has been taking steps to ensure that he doesn't get left behind in his former partner's wake. By 1988, those steps have come to fruition for Spencer, and he has managed to take two of Marcus's most trusted confidants, the aforementioned William Birkin and, of course, Albert Wesker, and has brought them into his own fold. Now working for Spencer instead of the oblivious Marcus, Birkin and Wesker, on the orders of their new boss, execute an attack on Marcus. While he's working on a queen leech that he's injected with the T-Virus as part of his experiments, Marcus is attacked and assassinated by Wesker and Birkin. With the help of Spencer, Birkin not only takes credit for the work done by Dr. Marcus, but also gains access to all of his research, which empowers him to take that research even further. This is where Lisa Trevor comes into play. Remember her? The daughter of the architect of the Spencer mansion? Well, yes, the very same. It's been years since she was abducted by Spencer, so what's been going on with her? Well, this entire time, she's basically been a test subject for Spencer and his scientists in the lab under the mansion. And somehow, after all of these years of being a lab rat, she's managed to cling on to life. Thanks to a convoluted series of events, Birkin ends up using her as a last viable subject in one of his experiments, which involves a deadly parasite that reacts with an isolated and mutated progenitor strand within her, creating something entirely new altogether. She grows hideous tentacles and begins to show signs of regenerative capabilities. As time goes on over the next few years, Lisa begins recovering some amounts of intelligence, which had been lost due to her result of having been infected to the T-Virus. As a result, she begins attacking researchers in the lab under the mansion. By the time she has killed her third researcher, Umbrella decides that she is too dangerous and executes her. But don't worry, she'll be back. Just not right now. Going back to the moment that she is experimented on by Birkin, though, the mutated strain of the progenitor virus within her is quickly identified as the cause. The virus, unlike the T-virus, bestows regenerative capabilities to those who are infected with it and can essentially make them biologically immortal. 
Birkin gives it the name G-Virus, and when Spencer catches wind of his accomplishments and what the virus is capable of, he decides to invest heavily in Birkin to allow him to keep his research going. For this purpose, Umbrella builds Nest, a huge underground laboratory not far from the mansion itself placed right underneath Raccoon City. At Nest, Birkin and his wife Annette are in charge. This will be important later on, so do not forget about this. We're almost at Resident Evil Zero by now, just a little more backstory for one more character. Let's go back to Wesker for a bit, shall we? In 1996, a few years after construction on Nest is completed, Wesker joins up with a special division in the Raccoon City Police Department known as the Special Tactics and Rescue Service, or STARS, an elite force within the RPD. Here, Wesker functions as an undercover agent for Umbrella Corporation, to whom he is constantly giving information on investigations conducted by the RPD in order to make sure that they don't catch wind of what's going on at Umbrella. But of course, Wesker also has selfish motivations for basically everything he does, which we'll get into that later on. By 1998, Wesker has become the captain of STARS, as well as a leader of the division's alpha team. And 1998 is where we finally move into the events of Resident Evil proper. It starts off when the Ecliptic Express, a train owned by the Umbrella Corporation, mysteriously comes under attack by a swarm of leeches, with the entire crew and all of the passengers aboard presumably being killed. Very shortly, just a few hours later in fact, reports begin emerging of cannibalistic attacks taking place in the Arclay Mountains, just outside of Raccoon City. To investigate these attacks, the RPD dispatches a star squad to the mountains, and that, finally, is where Resident Evil Zero picks up. In part one of our Resident Evil story recap, we spent the vast majority of our time on laying down the groundwork and going over loads of backstory in some detail, which will be important later on as we begin to talk about the events in the games themselves. In part two, we'll be recounting the events portrayed in the first two mainline games in the series' chronology, Resident Evil Zero and Resident Evil 1. Before we begin talking about how the Bravo team of STARS fares in its mission to investigate the attack on the Ecliptic Express and all of the strange killings that have been reported in the Arclay Mountains, let's stick with Albert Wesker for a while, because by now, Umbrella knows that things have started spiraling out of control, and as such, any investigations into these events, which are bound to happen, will throw a wrench into their plans. Wesker is tasked with damage control. He's told to lead the stars astray in their mission, which is something we'll get into in just a bit, and sacrifice them to Umbrella's experiments in order to not only remove any potential witnesses, but also to provide Umbrella with combat data on their BOWs. He's also told to recover the embryos of all of the BOWs that Umbrella have deployed and to destroy the Umbrella laboratory under the Spencer Mansion to remove traces of any evidence. As Resident Evil Zero begins, Bravo team of stars is on board a helicopter en route to the Arclay Mountains as their mission begins. The Bravo team consists of Forrest Speyer, Kevin Dooley, Kenneth Sullivan, and Richard Aiken. None of them are going to be too relevant moving forward though. The Bravo team members who will be relevant are Enrico Marini, the captain of the stars Bravo team, and Rebecca Chambers, an 18-year-old rookie medical officer in the team who is on her first mission for stars and is, most importantly, also our protagonist. As Bravo Team's chopper is on its way to its destination, its engine malfunctions. This should be noted that it was actually sabotaged by Wesker before it took off, forcing it to crash land in the forest. The team is split up and Rebecca explores the surrounding area to investigate and regroup with her squad. As she does so, she comes across the train Eclipse. Rebecca explores the train only to find it overrun by its passengers and crew, who have been transformed by the swarm of leeches that attacked it into zombies. On the train, Rebecca also encounters someone else, Billy Cohen, a former United States Marine Corps lieutenant who apparently was wrongfully convicted for the murder of several people and was being transported for execution in a base in Raccoon City before the military van transporting him crashed, allowing him to escape and hide in the crashed train. After Rebecca and Billy meet up, they notice a mysterious young man off in the distance, someone neither of them recognize. Before any of them can make their way to him, the train, with two of them still on board, begins to move again. How? Well, unbeknownst to Rebecca and Billy, two members of the Umbrella Security Services, or USS, an elite security wing of the corporation, had been ordered by Wesker and Birkin to retake control of the train and destroy it, and with it, any evidence on board. 
Before they can complete said mission, the two are attacked and killed by leeches, leaving Rebecca and Billy on a train that is speeding out of control. The duo manages to apply the brakes, literally, and redirect its course. When the train stops, they find themselves close to an abandoned complex. This abandoned complex, as you may have guessed, is one that is quite significant in the history of Umbrella Corporation. And as Rebecca and Billy explore it, they found out just why that is the case. This facility, they discover, was one that was used by Umbrella for the purpose of training future Umbrella officers and executives, and was run by none other than Dr. James Marcus. Rebecca and Billy make the discovery that Marcus was the one responsible for the progenitor virus and, in turn, the T-virus, which Umbrella would go on to weaponize as B.O.W.'s. Soon, due to certain circumstances, Billy and Rebecca get separated, and as she is looking for Billy, Rebecca runs into Enrico Marini, the captain of the Bravo team. Marini tells Rebecca that the rest of the Bravo team is regrouping at an abandoned mansion not far from the training facility and that they'll continue their mission there. He allows Rebecca to stay behind to look for Billy and then meet up with the squad later before leaving himself. The mansion, as you may have guessed, is none other than the Spencer Mansion, which we will get to in a bit. In the here and now, some serious things are about to go down because as soon as Marini leaves, Rebecca is attacked by something that can be best described as a monstrosity, which is unlike any of the regular zombies she had come across until now. Hulking, muscular, dangerously agile, and stunningly strong, with an ability to withstand extreme damage unlike any other zombies Umbrella has managed to conjure up until this point. This, as Resident Evil fans know, is a tyrant, a line of super soldier-esque mutations that the corporation had been developing and cloning as the ultimate B.O.W.'s. Miraculously, Rebecca manages to withstand its attacks and is able to temporarily defeat it before she manages to track down and meet up with Billy again. The two are promptly attacked by the tyrant yet again, and working together, they manage to bring it down once more. Don't worry though, we'll be seeing a lot more of the tyrants as we cover more of this series, so think of this as a very temporary reprieve. Billy and Rebecca continue onwards in pursuit of the mysterious leech-controlling man they had briefly encountered earlier on the train, and as they do so, they find themselves in a water treatment plant. And this is where things come to a head, and where the true identity of the leech-controlling man is fully revealed. Ten years ago, Dr. James Marcus was betrayed and assassinated by William Birkin and Albert Wesker at the orders of Spencer, while Marcus was experimenting with a queen leech, which is something that we've already discussed. What we haven't discussed, however, is the fact that after Marcus's corpse was dumped, it got taken over by the very virus he had been working on. The Queen Leech entered his body and reanimated it. And as it did, not only did it gain shape-shifting abilities, it also gained access to all of Marcus's memories, whereupon it started believing itself to be Marcus. Over the next 10 years, the Queen Leech devised a plan to exact vengeance upon Umbrella, a plan which came to fruition when it caused the outbreak of the T-Virus, as well as an attack on the train by a swarm of leeches. Rebecca and Billy face off against the Queen Leech in a harrowing and long-drawn climactic fight. The fake but also kind of real Dr. Marcus, as you can imagine, is not easy to take down, but take him down they do. While doing so, they also inadvertently trigger a self-destruct sequence in the facility. Rebecca and Billy escape, having not only killed the Queen Leech, but also having triggered the destruction of the facility. As Resident Evil Zero comes to an end, Rebecca promises Billy that her police report of the entire incident will mark him down as yet another casualty, essentially giving the wrongly accused man his freedom back. Billy thanks her and the two part ways, with Billy on his way to an unknown location, and Rebecca making her way towards Spencer Mansion not too far from her current position, leading directly into the events of Resident Evil 1. But let's pause yet again and yet again go back to Albert Wesker, because things with Wesker rarely ever go where you think that they will. He was given a set of tasks to accomplish by Umbrella, tasks that we've already discussed, and some of which we've already seen in Resident Evil Zero. But Wesker is a smart man, and as the events of Resident Evil Zero start coming to a head, Wesker realizes that things are spiraling out of control, and he wants to get out while he still can. But he also wants to make sure that the getting out is profitable for him as well. Wesker has been contacted by a mysterious rival corporation of umbrellas known only as The Organization, who have offered him safety and employment if he steals Umbrella's BOW embryos and brings them to him. 
Wesker offers Birkin a chance to join him, but Birkin refuses. Not out of a sense of loyalty or anything like that, no. He does so because he wants to stay at Nest, his underground facility underneath Raccoon City, and finish his research on the G-Virus, which is something that we'll be speaking a lot more of when we cover the events of Resident Evil 2. Wesker then is still looking to accomplish pretty much the same things he had before he decided to leave Umbrella, sacrifice the stars members, steal the embryos, but this time for entirely different reasons. And now with that out of the way, let's jump back to the story at hand, the story of Resident Evil 1, where we shift our focus from Rebecca and the Bravo team to the Alpha team. Stars' Alpha team consists of names that fans of the series will be very familiar with. Chris Redfield, Jill Valentine, Barry Burton, Brad Vickers, Joseph Frost, and of course, none other than Albert Wesker himself, the undercover Umbrella agent, for now, who's also the captain of the Stars Division and the leader of Alpha Team. After RPD loses contact with Bravo Team and is unable to communicate with them, Alpha Team is sent out after them to investigate just what the hell is going on. Alpha Team's chopper lands at the spot where they see the crashed helicopter of Bravo Team in the forest, but before they can investigate it, they're attacked by a pack of monstrous zombified dogs. In the attack, one of their squad members, Frost, is killed. Alpha Team's chopper pilot, Brad Vickers, panics, gets back in the chopper, and takes off, leaving the rest of the squad stranded in the forest, forcing them to seek refuge in a nearby abandoned mansion. Yes, the Spencer Mansion. The mansion, as you might have guessed, has seen better days. For starters, it's completely overrun by zombies and zombified creatures and monsters as a result of the T-virus outbreak that was orchestrated by Dr. Marcus's queen leech-infused body. The T-virus, in fact, also came in contact with the deceased Lisa Trevor, who now also stalks the dilapidated remains of the mansion and is a threat that Alpha Team finds itself squaring off against as well. In the mansion, the Alpha team is separated, and Jill or Chris, depending on who you choose to play as, also meets up with the members of the Bravo team, but not in the way that you would have expected. Yeah, you might have guessed this, they're all either dead or zombies, or are brutally killed right in front of you. Well, not exactly all of them. Chris or Jill also come across Enrico Marini, the leader of Bravo Team. Marini tells them that one of the members of Alpha Team is a traitor, but before he can tell them who that person is, they're shot and killed by an unseen shooter. Chris also meets up with Rebecca Chambers, who by this point is the last surviving member of Bravo Team. As players explore the mansion, the curtain on Umbrella's clandestine activities is slowly pulled back. The player character learns about the underground lab, about Umbrella's illegal and not-so-moral experiments, and of course, about the T-Virus. Eventually, Chris or Jill make their way to the underground lab, where they find whichever of the two you're not playing as in a cell. But that's not all they find. They also find Albert Wesker fiddling around with yet another tyrant, which he intends to program to wipe out all of Alpha Team. Wesker reveals his true colors here, revealing that he's a double agent and that he's been heavily involved with Umbrella's activities. What Jill or Chris do not know is that earlier, Wesker had infected himself with a mutant virus strain, something that won't come into play just yet, but will obviously be important as time goes on, so keep that in mind. Wesker releases the tyrant, but things don't exactly play out the way he had imagined that they would, because the first person that the tyrant attacks is Wesker himself. It stabs Wesker through the chest, and based on all outward appearances, he dies, but not really to the surprise of no one, but for now, consider him dead. We'll be back to Wesker later. With Wesker out of the way, the tyrant then turns its attention to Chris or Jill. A chaotic struggle ensues, but it's one that the player character is able to overcome and manages to defeat the tyrant. Immediately afterward, they trigger the lab self-destruct sequence and escape outside calling in extraction. There's more than one possible ending in Resident Evil, but we're going to focus on the good ending, which is canon. Chris, Jill, Barry, and Rebecca manage to get on board a helicopter and escape, while the mansion, and everything still inside of it, is completely destroyed thanks to the lab's self-destruct. And that's where we're going to go ahead and finish part two. When we come back for part three, we'll be heading over to Raccoon City itself as we talk about the events of Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. 
In part two of our recap of the mainline Resident Evil games, we spoke about the events of Resident Evil Zero and Resident Evil One, about the excursions of the Bravo and Alpha teams of the STARS unit into the Arclay Mountains across both games. In part three, we'll be moving into Raccoon City proper as we recount the events of Resident Evil Two. Things have never really been on track when you look at the bigger picture ever since the three founders of Umbrella got their hands on the flower that gave birth to the project virus. But while till now their exploits have only had relatively small-scale effects in the outskirts of Raccoon City, the events of Resident Evil 2 are when things really, really start getting out of hand on a larger scale. But before we get into the immediate events of Resident Evil 2, it's important to take a look at some very important things that happened beforehand, after the events of the first Resident Evil. These events revolve around a single character that we've spoken of quite a bit up until now, but whose actions will go on to spell dire consequences for an entire city. That man, of course, is William Birkin. As you might remember, when Wesker made Birkin the offer to defect from Umbrella and instead join their rival corporation, Birkin turned him down, instead wanting to stay at Nest, the lab beneath Raccoon City that Spencer had funded and built for him, so that he could complete his work on the G-Virus, which up until now had proven to be the most advanced and as such the deadliest rendition of what had originally started out as just an innocent little flower in West Africa. And after the events of Resident Evil 0 and 1, that is where Birkin still remains. Alongside his wife and fellow brilliant scientist Annette Birkin, he leads up Nest as the duo and the people working under them continue to make strides in their research, developing G-Virus further and further and further, without any regard for the consequences their work might lead to. But once their work has progressed enough, Birkin decides to use it for his own gains. Obviously, he had no loyalty to Umbrella, and only wanted to use the resources they offered to help him complete his work on G. And once that work was close to completion, Birkin contacted the United States military, telling them that he would go rogue and sell the virus to them for a hefty price. The military naturally agrees, seeing huge potential in how they could weaponize the virus. But Umbrella, too, catches wind of Birkin's exploits. They try to shut him down, and when Birkin refuses to allow them access to Nest, the corporation decides to take extreme measures in order to keep their property, the G-Virus, safe in their own hands. What do they do? They send a squad of the USS, the Umbrella Security Services, led by an enigmatic and mysterious operative called Hunk, to bring Birkin in alive and acquire the virus from him. Things, as you may have guessed, don't go as planned. Hunk's squad enters Nest and makes its way to its target, but William Birkin refuses to go down without a fight. He tells them that the G-Virus virus is his life's work and things begin heating up. One of the USS operatives has a particularly itchy trigger finger and believing that Birkin is making a move to attack them, fires several shots into the man. Birkin drops to the ground, ridden with bullet wounds, and the USS squad picks up his G-Virus samples and leaves. But again, Birkin is not gonna go down without a fight. He takes another sample of the G-Virus and injects himself with it, to not only ensure that he doesn't succumb to his wounds and die, but also so that he can become strong enough to take out the USS operatives who stole his virus from him. But just as he does so, Annette Birkin walks in. Horrified at what she has witnessed and what her husband has done, she pulls a gun on him, wanting to put him down before the virus's transformation can take over. But of course, she can't do it. She's his wife, after all. All that is pretty important setup for other things that go down in Resident Evil 2, so keep that in mind as we move forward. But before we move away from William Birkin and enter to the Midwestern town of Raccoon City. Let's stay in this pivotal moment just a while longer and talk about something hugely important. There's a lot that goes on with Birkin, Annette, and the people around them in Resident Evil 2, but one of the first things William does after he injects himself with the virus is track down the USS squad. Empowered, twisted, and turned by the transformation of the G-Virus, Birkin is constantly losing himself at a rapid rate, but he does have superhuman strength too. He finds the USS operatives in the sewers beneath Raccoon City, and when he does, he makes short work of them. Well, all except Hunk, their leader, who manages to escape. When he decimates the USS squad, one of the soldiers carrying the case with the G-Virus in it does something that goes on to spell disastrous consequences. He drops the case. He drops the case, the vial breaks, the virus pours to the floor, and rats in the sewers come in contact with it, becoming the carriers of this deadly, terrifying contagion. Throughout the history of humankind, rats 
Elephants have been carriers of some of the most deadly plagues and diseases known to our species, so it's grimly fitting that it's with rats that the G-Virus goes from being contained in a single vial to rapidly spreading throughout an entire city. Because that is exactly what it does. The outbreak hits Raccoon City hard, and most if not all of the population is affected by it one way or another. And now, we turn our attention to the events of Resident Evil 2 proper, where we put the spotlight on both of its protagonists, rookie police officer Leon S. Kennedy and fiery college student Claire Redfield. When we say Leon Kennedy is a rookie police officer of the Raccoon City Police Department, or the RPD, we mean really rookie. As in, he just got the job. When Resident Evil 2 begins, he's reporting for literally his first day on duty. And Claire, as her name might have given away, she's the sister of Chris Redfield, who, as you might remember, is a STARS agent. When news breaks out of the outbreak in Raccoon City, both Leon and Claire arrive in town for different reasons. Leon, who had been told to stay away by the senior cops earlier, comes in because he feels his fellow officers might need him in this time of crisis, which is putting it mildly. Meanwhile, Claire finds out about the outbreak and decides to go to the city to find her brother, make sure he's safe and alive, and then leave town with him. Right at the beginning of Resident Evil 2, the paths of Leon and Claire collide. Happenstance finds them both in the same place, where the two of them are attacked by large numbers of zombies. They manage to escape and, forced together because of the circumstances as they are, get into a car and drive away. Realizing that they're both headed to the police station, Leon because he's a cop and Claire because she's looking for Chris, they decide to accompany each other. But soon, they're forced to part ways once again when a truck driver, delirious because of a zombie having bitten him earlier, crashes into them. Eventually, they both make it to the police station separately, and both Leon and Claire then spend a very eventful and terrifying night in Raccoon City. The RPD, an old building that once used to be a museum, had become a last line of defense of sorts for the denizens of the city. As the outbreak spread and the city started falling, the RPD became a refuge for the survivors. Here, they locked themselves in, hoping to survive and make it to whenever it was that someone sent rescue, or any form of aid, if that ever happened. The station, however, started running low on things like food, while the zombies started piling up outside, eventually trapping the survivors inside. Tensions obviously arose, and things, as you might expect, did not go well for the people inside. By the time Leon and Claire get to the station, there's next to no one left alive. Now, because of the inconsistencies between the two campaigns of the Resident Evil 2 remake, it's a little hard to put the pieces of the chronology of events into place. Who meets whom, who goes where first, stuff like that. So we'll most likely be going over the main talking points here. But we'd be remiss not to mention Marvin Branagh, a police officer who had a small role in the original Resident Evil 2, which was largely expanded in the remake. Marvin helps out Claire and or Leon when they make it into the police station in their efforts to find another way out, but eventually succumbs to a zombie bite. In the station, Claire doesn't find Chris, but she does find out where he is, in Europe. She finds a letter written by him to his fellow STARS members, and though it might seem like a regular letter checking in on his friends written while he was on vacation, what it essentially is, is code. Because the real reason Chris is in Europe is that he's been tracking down Umbrella since the events of Resident Evil 1, and has traveled to Europe to dismantle their operations. This will come into play later on, so file this away for now. Some other important details also come to light. For instance, Irons, the chief of Raccoon City's police, isn't exactly the man you'd want leading the city's PD. Why? Because he, as it turns out, has been in Umbrella's pocket. More specifically, he's been in William Birkin's pocket, who's been paying him to enable Umbrella's research and to keep silent about their illegal activities. Irons, in fact, also had a hand in making sure that Umbrella was able to construct nests right underneath Raccoon City quietly. And he does some other stuff too. We'll get to that in just a bit. Because for now, there's some other far more dangerous things walking around RPD, like a tyrant. The Tyrant. The one Resident Evil fans immediately think of as soon as they think of these hulking bio-organic super soldiers created by Umbrella, Mr. X. The role of Mr. X is slightly different in the remake from his role in the original. For starters, in the original Resident Evil 2, Umbrella actually set in multiple tyrants, while in the remake there's only one. Additionally, Mr. X's mission in the original was to retrieve a certain pendant from a certain somebody, which we'll get to shortly. While in the remake, his mission is plain 
plain and simple, to hunt down and kill any survivors in Raccoon City in order to erase any evidence or witnesses that can attest to Umbrella's wrongdoings. In the RPD then, as Leon and Claire are looking for a way out, they're constantly being stalked by Mr. X, but the two of them also meet some other people who prove to be instrumental to both their stories. Let's start with Claire, who comes across a young girl named Sherry, who is far more important than you'd initially think. Sherry, you see, is actually Sherry Birkin, the daughter of William and Annette Birkin. There's a lot going on with Sherry. For starters, she's being hunted by William Birkin, why is she being hunted by her own father, though? Well, because by this point, William Birkin is barely even her father anymore. Ever since he injected himself and threw out the entirety of Resident Evil 2, the G-Virus continues to grow and mutate in his body, taking over all his functions and essentially turning him into nothing more than a shell of a host, to the point where though the body is clearly that of William Birkin's, the thing inside is whatever the virus's transformation has created. And the virus, you see, is always looking to replicate, which is a complicated process because not everybody can be a perfect host body, and more often than not, the virus can end up rejecting a host by killing it. Since William Birkin turned out to be a successful host though, so too can his daughter, thanks to their shared DNA, and since the G monster wants to replicate, it wants to infect Sherry. Sherry, incidentally, also wears a pendant around her neck, which was given to her by her mother, and is quite important as you might have guessed. In the original Resident Evil 2, the pendant contained a sample of the G-Virus, which is what Mr. X had been tasked with retrieving. In the remake, we'll get to it. So yeah, that's who Claire meets. She meets Sherry, terrified and alone, and tells her she'll help her find her mother, not knowing yet that her mother is Annette Birkin. But who does Leon meet? Someone equally interesting. Leo meets the enigmatic Ada Wong. Ada is an undercover mercenary who's been tasked with retrieving a sample of the G-Virus by any means necessary by none other than Albert Wesker himself. Though, of course, that's completely hush-hush. Obviously, though, that's not what she tells Leon, and has a completely different story ready for who she is, which also varies depending on whether it's the original RE2 we're talking about or the remake. In the original Resident Evil 2, Ada claims to be looking for her boyfriend, who she claims is a researcher at Umbrella. Meanwhile, in the remake, she tells Leon she's an FBI agent who's been in investigating Umbrella for months, and is on a mission to finally take them down. Being the naive rookie that he is, for now anyway, Leon believes her, and tells her he'll help her in her mission. Oh poor Leon, you sweet summer child. Meanwhile, Claire and Sherry encounter Chief Irons. Yeah, that guy. Irons holds Claire at gunpoint, ties her up, and then takes Sherry away. In the struggle, Sherry drops her pendant, which Claire retrieves, now determined to track Irons down and rescue Sherry. While she's looking for a way out of the station, she's contacted by Irons, who, as it turns out, needs the pendant. He tells Claire to bring the pendant to him at the orphanage a few blocks away from the station, which is an area and plot point that is completely new in the remake. The orphanage, you see, is not really an orphanage at all. It's a front, set up by Umbrella with the help of Chief Irons, which Umbrella uses to further its own machinations. How? Well, they use the children in the orphanage as test subjects for their experiments. Claire manages to find a way out of the station and makes her way to the orphanage, where she finds out that Birkin, now even more twisted by the virus than before, implanted a G-Virus embryo in the police chief. Irons, however, proves to be a bad match for a host body and ends up being killed by the G-Virus mutant inside him. Claire finds Sherry, and this is where their story moves into the sewers underneath Raccoon City. But wait, Leon and Ada's story moves to the sewers as well. After Leon tells Ada that he'll help her dismantle Umbrella and retrieve the virus from them, Ada tells him about their lab beneath the city, with the only way to get to it being through the sewers. Being the place where the outbreak originated, you can probably imagine what the sewers are like. Not very pleasant, even by sewer standards. Here, Leon and Ada are confronted by Annette. To put it concisely, after a series of events, Ada is grievously injured. And though Leon manages to rescue her, she tells him that her wound won't allow her to carry on. She asks Leon to go to Nest to retrieve the virus in her place, and being the naive rookie that he is, he agrees. And so he gets on a tram built by Umbrella in the sewers, which leads straight to their lab. As you might have guessed, Claire and Sherry also wind up in Nest. So what happens to them in the sewers? As it turns out, the monster known as G, who won 
once used to be William Birkin successfully implanted a virus in Sherry, and Sherry is sick and getting sicker by the minute. Claire also encounters Annette here, and after an argument between the two about how crappy Annette is at parenting, Annette tells her to take Sherry to Nest, where she can find a vaccine for the virus. Sherry's pendant, by the way, is literally a key which can grant access to where the vaccine is kept, in the remake, that is. And now we move into the final phase of Resident Evil 2's story, as all major players find themselves in Nest, the birthplace of the deadly G-Virus. Here, major revelations come to light, before some final confrontations against terrifying monstrosities take place. For starters, Leon finds out thanks to Annette that Ada isn't who she says she is at all, that she's actually a mercenary who's been paid by one of Umbrella's rivals to steal the G-Virus. Leon manages to recover a sample of the virus, but as soon as he does, the lab security protocols kick in. And you know what that means. A self-destruct sequence is initiated. In the midst of explosions that are causing the lab to literally fall apart, Leon confronts Ada, asking her if what Annette told him is true. In response, Ada simply pulls a gun on him, telling him to hand over the virus. Leon, ever the model for doing what's right, refuses to do so, telling Ada that she's gonna have to kill him if she wants the virus. But of course, Ada doesn't do it. Before anyone else can make another move, a shot rings out, burying itself straight into Ada, shot by Annette Birkin in the background, who only wants for the virus which she helped create to not fall into the wrong hands. Believing Ada to be dead, though of course she isn't really dead, Leon makes his way out of the lab even as it crumbles around him. But of course he has one final obstacle to face, Mr. X, who by now has transformed and mutated into a super tyrant. After a grueling fight, Leon is finally able to kill the unkillable, and Mr. X, who has refused to die no matter what you throw at him, finally dies. In the remake, Mr. X dies in both campaigns, and dies in different ways, but since his fight against Leon as the super tyrant is what is shown in the original, let's just go with that. At the same time, Claire explores Nest as she looks for a cure to heal Sherry, and ultimately recovers it, but she faces her own hurdles as well. She is attacked by G, aka Birkin, who is now a full-blown monstrosity with barely any hints left of the human he used to be. Claire, too, is involved in a heated and deadly fight of her own, and with the help of Annette, she succeeds in finally killing Birkin. Before dying, though, he's able to deliver a deadly blow to his wife, and the wound she incurs soon ends up killing her. Though in the remake, she does get a final moment of goodbye with her daughter, right as Claire gives her the vaccine and cures her. Both Leon and Claire meet up at last, finding a train that proves to be the only way out of the lab and a way out is what they need desperately, considering the fact that the lab is moments away from being destroyed, and burying them alive in its ruins. But of course it's not over yet, as Leon, Claire, and Sherry get aboard the train, they face one final challenge. William Birkin ain't dead yet. The monster known as G has now fully taken over, spreading outward with hideous growths to turn into absolute nightmare fuel, large enough to devour the train they're on whole. Leon or Claire, depending on the order you played the campaign, pain in, face off against G one final time, and are able to finally, once and for all, for real this time, I promise, kill it. Leon, Claire, and Sherry make it out, finally, ending their night of terrors in Raccoon City, having become determined to look for the people responsible and make sure that Umbrella's machinations are brought to an end. These events, as you may have guessed, lead directly into Code Veronica. And this is where we're gonna end part three, though this is leading directly into the beginning of Code Veronica. Well, almost directly. There is one other game that we have to talk about before we get to it, which is what we'll be covering in part four, Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. In part three of our recap, we covered the events of Resident Evil 2, talking about Leon and Claire's misadventures in Raccoon City. In part four, we'll be recapping the events shown in Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. Though Resident Evil 3 Nemesis is a sequel to Resident Evil 2 in technical terms, as far as the chronology of its events is concerned, it's more of a side mission in that a section of its story takes place a day before Resident Evil 2's events, and another section a couple of days after them. While the first two Resident Evil games released would both offer players the choice to play as one of two protagonists, Resident Evil 3 was instead a one-woman show with STARS member Jill Valentine, who is one of the two protagonists of RE1, taking center stage. 
As Resident Evil 3 begins, Raccoon City is caught in the grips of the outbreak, with every corner of the city teeming with zombified monstrosities. Under such dire circumstances, Jill realizes that her only chance at survival is to escape the city altogether. She sets out for the RPD, making her way across the streets of the city while fighting off or avoiding the zombies that lie in her path. On her way to the police station, she comes across someone you might remember, fellow STARS officer Brad Vickers, the chopper pilot, who, as you might remember at the beginning of the first game, flew away in panic, leaving his fellow STARS members stranded in the Arclay Mountains. As Jill and Brad make their way to the RPD, right outside the police station's gates, they're stopped by something immensely terrifying. If you thought Mr. X was a monstrosity, wait till you get a load of this guy. Nemesis is, on paper, also a tyrant, but it's far more terrifying than any other tyrant bioweapon Umbrella has ever cooked up. Vastly more intelligent than any other B.O.W., with far superior strength and dexterity, Nemesis is more than just a formidable foe. And what's its purpose? It's an experimental weapon designed by Umbrella, of course, with its mission being to track down and kill all members of the RPD STARS unit, who were witnesses to Umbrella's devious shenanigans. And as soon as it makes its appearance, Nemesis gets to work on its mission. With a single brutal blow, it impales Brad with a massive spike appendage, killing him swiftly but painfully. Completely taken aback and rightly scared out of her wits, Jill makes a run for it and enters the RPD, though the game does give the player a choice to fight Nemesis there and then. But really, who in their right minds would want to do that? The police station, as we already know from the events of Resident Evil 2, is in a sorry state, with little to no survivors left, and its hallways crawling with zombies. Constantly being pursued by Nemesis through the RPD, Jill equips herself with some requisite weaponry, and then, in the star's office, hears a transmission on the radio coming from a man named Carlos who's requesting for backup. With Nemesis still in pursuit, who's also equipped with a rocket launcher, did we fail to mention that? Jill flees from the station. Back out in the streets of Raccoon City, Jill makes her way forward while fighting for her life, coming across everything from regular old human zombies to vicious zombified dogs. Eventually, Jill runs into Carlos, the man who'd been on the radio, and finds out just who he is. Carlos tells Jill that he's a member of the Umbrella Biohazard Countermeasure Service, or the USBC, who had deployed a squad of soldiers to Raccoon City to, allegedly, help rescue the city's denizens. Yeah, sure, okay, Umbrella, whatever you say. But Jill is no naive fool. She's been through the grinder, she's seen what Umbrella has been up to for all these years, and she knows that they have ulterior motives in everything they do. Obviously then, she doesn't trust Carlos, but Carlos, on the other hand, says he's nothing more than a mercenary who's being paid to do a job, and that he neither knows nor cares about what Umbrella actually is. Given the fact that she's caught in the middle of a city teeming with zombies, not to mention the fact that Nemesis is still chasing her and doing everything in its power, and it has a lot of power, to see her dead, Jill doesn't really have much of a choice. She may not trust Carlos, but she knows that for now, she at least has to work with him. So it is then that the two of them together make their way to a tram car, where Jill meets the rest of Carlos's squad, comprised of Nikolai Zinoviev and their squad leader Mikhail Victor, who is already injured quite badly when Jill meets him. Tensions brew once again between Jill and Nikolai, neither of whom trust each other, but Carlos soon steps in and vouches for Jill. Begrudgingly, Nikolai tells her that they have a way out of the city, if they can make it to the Raccoon City clock tower and then ring the tower's bell, they'll be able to signal an extraction chopper to fly in. Conveniently enough, there's also a landing zone right in that very area, making it an ideal escape route. But there's a catch, of course. The only safe way to get to the clock tower is by getting there via the tram car they're currently standing in, but the tram car isn't working, and they need to gather up some parts to get it to operate again. Jill, Carlos, and Nikolai set out to gather parts they need from across the city, but their trek proves to be very eventful. For starters, Nikolai gets caught in an explosion caused under strange circumstances, and Jill presumes him to be dead. Following that, while Jill is gathering more of the parts she needs, she's set upon by Nemesis, who seems to have a weird knack for tracking her down. 
As she runs from the monstrosity, the ground gives way beneath her feet, and she crashes into an underground tunnel, where she still catches no respite. She's attacked by a giant mutated millipede, completely transformed by large doses of the T-virus, and dubbed the Gravedigger. Jill manages to escape, and finally manages to make her way back to the tram with all the required parts. Sure enough, the tram gets moving again, with Jill, Carlos, and the injured Mikhail on board, but it doesn't take long for things to go wrong again. No points for guessing how, though. Yep, Nemesis breaks into the tram. Heroically, Mikhail makes his stand against Nemesis, fighting against the BOW. But obviously, the injured soldier is no match for him and is easily swept aside with a crushing blow. Refusing to go down easily, Mikhail sacrifices himself with a grenade, blowing Nemesis right out of the tram with the resulting explosion, but not killing him, of course, and sending the tram crashing into the clock tower. Well, at least they reach their destination, right? Miraculously still alive, Jill and Carlos make their way up to the top of the clock tower, with Nemesis still in pursuit. They are able to reach the top safely, though, where Jill rings the tower's bell, and sure enough, the extraction chopper is soon spotted flying in their direction. But of course, things are not going to be so easy. Remember Nemesis's rocket launcher? It pulls it out and fires a rocket straight at the chopper, which is caught in a devastating explosion and is completely destroyed. With the chopper destroyed, Nemesis then moves on to Jill, his actual target. Well, one of them anyway. Jill confronts the monster, but though she attempts to fight it off, she is quickly overwhelmed. Nemesis stabs her with its tentacle, and though she manages to stun it bad enough to make it collapse temporarily, she incurs heavy damage as well. As she gets stabbed by Nemesis' tentacle, she is infected with the T-virus and falls unconscious herself. She's found by Carlos, who grabs her unconscious body and takes her to safety. At this point in Resident Evil 3, we jump ahead a couple of days later, with Jill still unconscious and infected with the virus, and Carlos watching over her. In an attempt to save Jill's life, Carlos makes his way into the Raccoon City General Hospital, which, it turns out, has also been an umbrella-funded front for the pharmaceutical company's experiments. Thankfully, though, that funding also means that resting inside the hospital is a vaccine for the virus. While in the hospital, though, Carlos makes some startling revelations. He comes across another mercenary who's visibly injured thanks to a gunshot wound. That gunshot wound, the mercenary claims, was given to him by Nikolai, who, as it turns out, had faked his death and is clearly up to no good. Though the mercenary dies immediately afterward thanks to an explosive booby trap, Carlos realizes that things with Nikolai might not be what they seem to be. Right now, however, Carlos has to press on with the task at hand. After many trials and tribulations, Carlos manages to get his hands on some of the cure, and though the hospital itself is completely destroyed due to a string of unfortunate events, also destroying all the remaining vaccine alongside it, Carlos is able to make his way back to Jill, inject her with the vaccine in his position, and restore her back to health. As soon as Jill regains consciousness, Carlos tells her that Nikolai is still alive. He tells her that there's something he needs to take care of, before telling her that he'll meet back up with her later, and then setting off on his own. But you can probably guess what happens next. It doesn't take long for Jill to be ambushed by Nemesis, who's much more mutated now, and as such, more powerful and durable yet again. She manages to make her escape and finds herself cutting through the raccoon park, where things begin to come to her head. Here, Jill encounters Nikolai, who reveals the full extent of his plans. Sent in as part of a group called the Supervisors, Nikolai's mission was to observe the combat effects of all the infected in Raccoon City, as well as BOWs sent into the city by Umbrella. As Nikolai is revealing what his true plans were, the ground begins to shake. Nikolai, who knows what the tremors mean, flees, while the ground once again caves in beneath Jill's feet. You can probably guess what happens next. Jill is confronted by the giant mutated millipede, the one known as Gravedigger. Jill engages the monster in a fight and is able to kill it by electrocuting it. Soon, Jill meets Carlos again, who explains some vital things. For starters, it's revealed that the US government is planning on launching a nuke on Raccoon City to eradicate any traces of the virus and stop the infection from spreading further, and they're doing it very soon. Which means that Jill and Carlos don't have long to escape. Thankfully, Carlos also tells Jill that he knows of a chopper in the vicinity, which they can use to make their escape. 
The conclusion of Resident Evil 3 is a harrowing one, which sees Jill squaring off against not only Nikolai, but also Nemesis, who has continued to mutate and transform into an even deadlier form. There are multiple ways things can turn out in the game's ending, but one way or another, Jill manages to stop or kill Nikolai, while also managing to finally kill Nemesis and put an end to his incessant terrors. Using either the chopper Carlos told her about, or being helped by fellow Stars member Barry Burton, who arrives on the scene with a different chopper, Jill and Carlos are able to escape. While they do so, a nuclear missile strikes Raccoon City, completely vaporizing the city and destroying everything inside of it, which of course also includes any evidence of Umbrella's wrongdoings. And just as Leon and Claire had done at the end of Resident Evil 2, just as Chris had decided to do before going off to Europe, Jill vows to do whatever it takes to dismantle Umbrella and bring the organization down. That's it for part 4. When we return for part 5, we'll be moving out of Raccoon City and going straight into the events of Resident Evil Code Veronica. In part 4 of our Resident Evil recap, we spoke of the events of Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, which culminated in Jill's escape from Raccoon City and the city's eventual destruction. In part 5, we'll be covering Resident Evil Code Veronica. With Resident Evil Code Veronica, we move away from a lot of familiar stuff. We move away from the location of Raccoon City completely, which makes sense since Raccoon City got blown to smithereens. We also move a bit into the realm of the outlandish. Code Veronica is, in many ways, where Resident Evil started its changing focus to become much cornier and much more bizarre. Before we move into that, though, let's go way back to a name that hasn't come up in a while, the Ashford Family. We last spoke of Dr. Edward Ashford, one of the original Umbrella top dogs, and how, following bitter rivalry with Spencer and Marcus, he ended up dead, survived by his son Alexander Ashford. Well, Alexander, unlike Edward, was a lot more into genetics, and so his experiments were a little different from the zombie-making ones you usually see with the Umbrella folk. Alexander Ashford used his genetic know-how to engineer a clone of his great-great-grandmother, one Veronica Ashford, as part of what was dubbed the T-Veronica experiment. A freak accident during the cloning process, though, caused cloned zygote to split, resulting in two clones, Alexia Ashford, who Alexander had intended to create, and Alfred Ashford. The reason the Ashford twins were created was to create a child who could, as part of the internal power struggles that had been going on at Umbrella, ensure and solidify Ashford influence in the corporation. And as such, Alexander Ashford put the highest value on how intelligent both of them were. Right from their births, the twins were treated differently for this very reason. While Alfred was found to be above average intelligence, Alexia was a child prodigy and received all of the best education that could be had. For one reason or the other, though, they both resented their father, Alexander, and found solace only in the company of one another. Eventually, the twins discovered the truth of their birth and origins, and disgusted by it, they decided to retaliate against Alexander. They forced him to undergo a T. Veronica procedure himself and locked him away, even as his body mutated and kept him sealed shut. Alexia soon picked up the pieces of the T. Veronica research, and not long afterward, she decided to experiment on herself. After injecting herself with the virus, she stored herself away cryogenically, figuring that the extended period that cryosleep would allow the virus to stay within her without being able to mutate her might yield favorable results, and telling her brother to wake her up when the time came. With Alexander and Alexia both publicly considered dead, Alfred became the head of the Ashford family, and though he went through rigorous training at Umbrella and managed to gain a certain amount of influence himself, the loss of his sister clearly did not sit well with him. His mental health continued to worsen, until finally he developed a second persona as Alexia herself, going as far as to even dress like her. The story of Code Veronica picks up many years later, in 1998. Roughly three months after the events of Resident Evil 2, Claire Redfield is still searching for her brother, Chris, and finally she thinks she's got a lead. She believes her brother is in an Umbrella Corporation facility in Paris, but when she infiltrates the lab, she finds out he isn't there. Soon, she gets herself caught, after which she is transported to another Umbrella facility over on the Ashford-owned Rockford Island. Her arrival at Rockford, as chance would have it, coincides with what looks like a greater conflict with the paramilitary group called HCF. And so, who is HCF led by? Well, none other than Albert Wesker himself. Yes, of course he isn't dead. 
Wesker, looking to get his hands on the T. Veronica virus, raids Rockford Island with his HCF soldiers as part of a sabotage operation, which results in much of the island's facilities failing, a T. virus strain being released, and multiple BOWs being set loose on the island. In the midst of all of this, and with the help of one Umbrella soldier named Rodrigo Juan Raval, Claire is able to escape from her cell, but immediately discovers that things are not going to get easier from here on out. Not only does she have to deal with another T-virus outbreak, it also seems Alfred Ashford thinks she is connected to the sabotage operation by HCF in some way and is hellbent on recapturing her. Soon afterward, Claire meets a certain someone named Steve Burnside, probably the most disliked character in the Resident Evil universe. Steve, as it turns out, is also a prisoner of Umbrella here on Rockford Island, thanks to run-ins that his father had with the corporation. Though their relationship immediately has its ups and downs, the two manage to work together well enough to get some things accomplished. For starters, Claire is able to communicate with Leon and tell him to get in touch with her brother, who clearly wasn't at the Paris lab, and tell him about Rockford Island and about her being there. Later, Claire and Steve are eventually able to get aboard a plane and flee from the Ashford residence. Alfred, however, had already set the plane on an autopilot course to someplace that decidedly isn't any safer than the Rockford Island, another umbrella facility in Antarctica. The facility in Antarctica, however, isn't faring very well either. Umbrella personnel from the Rockford facility had been retreating to the one in Antarctica as a result of all of the chaos on the island, and with them, they've also been bringing back the T-virus which they had been exposed. The Antarctica facility too is buckling under the weight of an outbreak. Soon after they've landed, Claire and Steve discover that the facility they're in is a few miles away from an observation base, and figure that they can probably commandeer a vehicle and escape to that base. As they look for one though, they encounter Alfred Ashford, who, of course, has followed them. A struggle ensues and Claire and Steve are somehow able to keep Alfred at bay and escape, but Alfred has one or two tricks up his sleeve. After his fight with Claire and Steve, he's able to awaken his sister, Alexia, and bring her out of cryosleep, now mutated by the T. Veronica strain. Claire and Steve, meanwhile, face another challenge as well, when they accidentally free and face off against Alexander Ashford. Remember him? The man who created the Ashford twins was mutated by a forced T. Veronica experiment long ago and turned into a monster who was given the name Nosferatu. When they square off against him, Claire is able to attack Nosferatu's exposed heart and kill him, finally bringing an end to his tortured existence. Soon, Claire and Steve finally manage to find a truck, and when they proceed to drive off in it, hoping to escape from the Antarctica facility, which of course does not happen, soon they're attacked by creepy plant tentacle mutations. And where exactly did these come from? You see, reawakening Alexia was in fact the last significant thing Alfred did, because soon afterward he succumbed to the wounds from his fight against Claire and Steve and died. Furious about her brother's death, Alexia uses her newfound abilities thanks to her successful mutation and uses the aforementioned plant tentacle things to destroy the truck that Claire and Steve are escaping in. Immediately afterward, the two of them are dragged away back to the base as Alexia's prisoners. Let's pause here for just a moment and move the spotlight away from Claire for just a bit, because she's not the only leading playable character in Resident Evil Code Veronica. Just as crucial to the story and how it plays out is her brother. Claire's message to Chris through Leon is successfully delivered, and immediately upon learning of his sister's whereabouts, he heads to Rockford Island to rescue her. When Chris gets to the island, though, he doesn't find his sister. No, instead, he ends up coming face to face once again with Albert Wesker. Wesker explains to him that he hadn't actually died when they last met, and that the incident actually ended up giving him superpowers thanks to the virus inside of him. Chris also eventually learns that Claire managed to escape from the island and fly away to the Antarctica facility, and so both Chris and Wesker head to the base separately and for different reasons. Chris to rescue Claire and Wesker because he finds out that's where Alexia is, and since that's where Alexia is, that is where he figures he'll get his hands on the T. Veronica virus as well. If he's able to kill Chris and his sister while he's there as well, well, that's just bonus for the good old Wesker. When Chris gets to the base, he does manage to find Claire, but the reunion is short-lived. After he helped free her, Claire tells him that she needs to go look for Steve, and she does find him, only not in the state that she had been hoping. She discovers that he'd been injected with the T. Veronica virus, and soon, the virus begins to take hold of him. Steve mutates rapidly, and as he does, he attacks Claire. 
But the mutation, as it turns out, isn't able to completely take over Steve. He fights it from within and is able to retake control long enough to stop himself from attacking Claire. As he does so, he then turns his attention to Alexia, but Alexia is far more powerful of a beast, fully in control of her own mutation. Alexia deals a deadly blow to Steve, and predictably enough, it proves to be too much for him to handle. As he lies weak and broken, his body reverts to his normal self, he professes his love for Claire, and dies. But what's going on with Wesker? Well, he's busy with Alexia too. He wants the virus from her, and she obviously isn't going to just freely hand it over. The two superpowered figures lock horns while Chris witnesses their fight, but just as it seems Alexia might have the upper hand, Wesker flees, leaving Alexia to focus on Chris instead. Chris manages to temporarily beat her, but temporary is the operative word here. Chris activates the facility's self-destruct sequence and reunites with Claire. As the two are attempting to flee from the base though, they're attacked by Alexia once again. In the final battle, after a tense encounter, they're able to use a special weapon called the Linear Launcher to finally, once and for all, bring Alexia down. But of course, it still isn't over. While Claire gets into the cockpit of the plane and prepares for liftoff, Chris crosses paths with Wesker. Telling Claire to begin taking off, he takes on Wesker in a hand-to-hand -hand duel, which proves to be a monumentally stupid decision. Thanks to his superpowers, Wesker absolutely wallops him. As Chris lies beaten though, he causes some hanging girders to collapse on Wesker's head, which doesn't kill him, sure, but does leave him injured, and gives Chris enough time to escape. As Chris escapes with Claire on their stolen plane, Wesker promises him that their next meeting will also be their last, and leaves as well. But Wesker never leaves until he's got what he came looking for, which he did here as well, of course, because when he escapes, he does so with the T-Veronica-infected corpse of Steve Burnside. Resident Evil 4 was a major reinvention of Capcom's celebrated horror franchise, not just in terms of gameplay, but the general tone and style as well. As such, from a narrative perspective, the game was radically different from anything else the series had done in the past, and really would go on to do in the future as well. As different as it was though, it was also a crucial point in the series' larger narrative, serving as an important chapter in the stories of several key characters. Here, we're going to take a look back at the full story of the legendary horror shooter. Resident Evil takes place in 2004, six years after the destruction of Raccoon City. By the time the game begins, the shady and corrupt activities of Umbrella Corporation have become public and the company has been made to pay for its crimes in more ways than one. Several high-level officials have been prosecuted, the company itself has been banned from any further activities, leading to bankruptcy, while the co-founder Oswell Spencer has gone into hiding now a wanted man across the globe. Things have changed drastically for others as well. Not long after the destruction of Raccoon City, Leon S. Kennedy, one of the few survivors of the incident, was recruited by the United States government, and after several years of training, is now a high-level Secret Service agent. As Resident Evil 4 kicks off, the U.S. President's daughter, Ashley Graham, has been reported missing, abducted by a mysterious cult known as the Los Illuminados, led by a man named Osmond Sadler. After receiving intel that Ashley was spotted in a remote village in Spain, the Secret Service dispatches Leon to the location, tasking him with rescuing her and bringing her back. Upon arriving at the scene, however, it doesn't take long for Leon to realize that things here are horribly amiss. The villagers, once peaceful farmers, have turned into mindless, violent freaks and begin attacking Leon in numbers as soon as he arrives. And what's responsible for this, as most bad things that happen in the Resident Evil universe, is a virus. Known as Las Plagas, this is a parasite that is being used by Los Illuminados leader Osmond Sadler to create bioweapons, and the scores of people that join his cult have all been infected with it, making them susceptible to mind control and turning them into obedient puppets. Those who have been infected are called the ganado, which is Spanish for livestock, and have been instructed by Sadler to kill any trespassers in order to maintain secrecy so that he and the researchers under him can carry out their bioterrorism activities undisturbed. Soon after his arrival in the village, Leon is taken captive by the village's chief, Vitores Mendez, and infected with one of the plagas. He finds himself in captivity with one Luis Serra, who used to be a researcher for the Los Illuminados, and was involved with the research of the Las Plagas and the creation of many bioweapons, but eventually became disillusioned with Sadler. Wanting to get out from under Sadler's heels, Sarah came into contact with a certain group, agreeing to bring them a sample of the dominant species Plagas. Leon's story in RE4 is an eventful one, but before we proceed, in order to understand it, we need to go over a bit of backstory. 
For starters, what is the dominant species Plagas? Well, unlike the regular variants of the parasite, the dominant species Plagas allows the host to retain their consciousness, and though it can often trigger heavy physical mutations, it does immunize the host from being mind controlled. So who exactly did Luis agree to steal a sample of the dominant species Plagas for? The answer to that question is the answer to many of Resident Evil's most nefarious questions, Albert Wesker. Well, at least indirectly. The person Luis came into contact with when he chose to escape from Los Illuminados was none other than Ada Wong, an agent of the group that was Umbrella's biggest rival, known simply as the organization. Once the organization came to know about the Las Plagas, Albert Wesker, one of their highest ranking members, dispatched another agent loyal to him to the village in Spain. That person was Jack Krauser, an American soldier who was once in training with Leon S. Kennedy. Upon being injured and discharged from duty, however, Krauser sought out Wesker, whom he had heard about from Leon, wanting not only a new purpose in life, but to become stronger through bioweapons much like Wesker had himself. Krauser faked his own death and became a member of the organization, loyal first and foremost to Wesker. Back to the present though. With the help of Luis Serra, Leon, who is yet unaware of Luis's past, is able to escape from captivity. The two go their separate ways, with Leon setting off once again to find and rescue Ashley Graham. He eventually finds her and soon discovers just why she was kidnapped in the first place. Just like Leon, Ashley too has been infected with the Plagas, with Sadler intending for her to be sent back to the president while she is under his control, and then to infect her father in turn, allowing Sadler to exert control over him as well. Having finally found Ashley, Leon decides that it's time to get the hell out of the village and back home. But as the two are making their way to a US government chopper for evacuation, the chopper is shot down, forcing them to seek shelter while another one arrives. They decide to head to a nearby castle, with Leon having to fight and kill Vittorius Mendez on the way. Even when they get to the castle though, things only go from bad to worse. That's because the castle is owned by a man named Ramon Salazar, who, alongside the now dead Mendez, is one of Sadler's chief lieutenants. Ashley is taken captive once again, leaving Leon to once more fight his way through the castle as he looks for her. And as he's doing that, he runs into a figure from his past that he remembers all too well, Ada Wong, another one of Raccoon City's survivors who still up to her shady double-crossing antics. But what exactly is Ada doing here of all places? Well, let's rewind a bit once more. The agent that the organization originally infiltrated the Los Illuminados with in order to recover a sample of the dominant species Plagas was Jack Krauser. Krauser, however, failed to return in time, which meant the next person they and Wesker turned to was Ada Wong. Wesker instructed her to bring the sample back to him, but as a man who isn't satisfied with life until he's played the role of at least a double agent, he had his own interests at heart first and foremost. Far from being loyal to the organization, Wesker had begun dealing with an African corporation known as Tricell, by this time one of the key players in the story of Resident Evil 5. Having already provided them with a sample of the G-Virus and the T-Veronica virus that he had acquired in the past, he intended to follow up with the Las Plagas as well, looking to build his own criminal empire to further his goals. The organization knew that Wesker was not to be trusted, so they instructed Ada to deceive him and deliver a recessive species Plaga sample to him, while bringing back the dominant species Plagas for the organization itself. It is for this purpose that Ada is here as well, and actually had almost crossed paths with Leon on multiple occasions. On a few occasions, her actions, unbeknownst to Leon, had even helped him out of tight spots, which is something that continues to happen throughout the remainder of Resident Evil 4. Now that the two are finally face to face, Leon demands answers, asking her about what she's doing here and about her ties to Wesker. Those answers, as you might guess, are not forthcoming, and the two part ways once more, with Leon continuing his search for Ashley and Ada going off on her own mission. Soon afterward, Ada receives orders from Wesker to eliminate Leon should their paths cross again, at which point she decides it would be best for Leon and herself if she avoided running into him again. As much as she likes to double cross him, she does have a soft spot for Leon after all. Leon eventually manages to find Ashley once again, just as Luis Serra too arrives on the scene with a sample of the dominant species Plagas that he fully intends to give to Leon to take back to the US government. Sarah is killed by Sadler though, who takes the sample back, grabs hold of Ashley once again, and flees from the castle, heading to a nearby island where Los Illuminados have set up a military and research base. Leon makes his way through the castle once more, fighting and killing the aforementioned Ramon Salazar in the process, before finally arriving at the heavily defended military and research island. 
and it's here that he squares off against Jack Krauser. The two men, who were once friends, engage each other in a duel, with Krauser under orders from Wesker to kill Leon. The fight is a long and arduous one, and even though Krauser has, at this point, been implanted with a dominant species Plagueis gene, he's unable to beat Leon. Ada gets in on the action as well at one point, shooting Krauser from a distance. Leon is ultimately able to best Krauser, seemingly killing him. The killing blow on him, however, lands when Ada chances upon him later on. Wanting revenge for her shooting at him while he was engaged in a knife fight with Leon, Krauser turns on Ada, but the latter defeats him as well, finally killing him. Once again, after finding and rescuing Ashley once more, Leon manages to find a specialized device thanks to research notes left behind by Luis, which he uses to purge the Plagueis virus from inside of himself and Ashley. The pair then heads for the second rescue chopper that's arrived to pick him and Ashley up, but this chopper too is shot down and destroyed. Soon afterward, Leon comes face to face with Sadler himself, who, thanks to the dominant species Plagueis virus inside of him, has grown to massive proportions and mutated beyond recognition. With the help of Ada, who, in typical fashion, tosses Leon a rocket launcher just when things are looking like they're getting a bit too out of hand, Leon takes Sadler on and manages to kill him, following which Leon retrieves a sample of the dominant species Plagueis from his corpse. But Ada, being Ada, is dedicated to her mission. Holding Leon at gunpoint, she takes the sample from him and climbs aboard an evac chopper set by the organization, flying off the island, while detonation charges set by the group all around the island begin counting down. Before leaving, however, she leaves behind the keys of a jet ski for Leon to use and escape with Ashley. As all of them escape one way or the other, the Los Illuminados facility explodes and caves in behind them. Leon returns to the US with Ashley and delivers his reports on the incident helping the Bioterrorism Security Assessment Alliance, or the BSAA, shore up their defenses for future encounters with the Las Plagas or similar bioweapons. Ada, meanwhile, does exactly what she was instructed to by the organization. Deceiving Wesker, she hands him a sample of the recessive species Plagueis while taking the dominant sample to her employers. But Albert Wesker is Albert Wesker for a reason. He is always one step ahead of anyone who thinks to cross him. Fully expecting to be betrayed by Ada and by the organization, Wesker eventually retrieves a sample of the dominant species Plagueis from the corpse of Jack Krauser anyway, thus coming one step closer to the realization of his master plan and leading directly into the events of Resident Evil 5. Though they're not full, numbered Resident Evil titles, the Revelations games are still canonical, semi-mainline titles. And though they're far from crucial to the series' larger story, they do fill in the blanks in some important ways. Resident Evil Revelations, for instance, takes place between the events of RE4 and 5 in the year 2005, and while it's by no means required reading for any of the other games in the series, it is still part of the RE canon. Here, we're going to recount the events of the game as part of our ongoing series in which we recap the franchise's story. An event that is an important part of Revelation's backbone in terms of narrative is the Terragrigia Panic. One year before the events of the game, a bioterror attack unleashed by bioterrorism group Il Veltro wreaked havoc on the city of Terragrigia. Anti-bioterrorism group Federal Bioterrorism Commission, or the FBC, shouldered the responsibility of dealing with the outbreak, and as a result, the city itself was completely destroyed. Revelation's story picks up one year later, putting the spotlight on Jill Valentine, who is now an agent of the Bioterrorism Security Assessment Alliance, or BSAA, a group that she herself co-founded with Chris Redfield. As Revelation's events kick off, Jill and fellow BSAA agent Parker Luciani are given a new assignment by BSAA head Clive O'Brien, tasking them with heading to an abandoned cruise ship, Queen Zenobia, in the Mediterranean. Their mission is to search for Chris and his new partner, Jessica Shurawat, who have gone missing, with the Queen Zenobia being their last known location. When Jill and Parker arrive on the ship, however, their mission quickly goes awry. Immediately, they encounter a new aquatic bioweapon known as the ooze, which is what people turn into when affected by the T-Abyss virus. On top of that, it turns out that Chris and Jessica were never on the ship, and that Jill and Parker have instead sprung a trap laid down by Il Veltro. They are both knocked unconscious and immediately taken captive. Chris and Jessica, in fact, are someplace else entirely, investigating the Valkoinen Moki airstrip, which is the headquarters of Il Veltro. When they manage to re-establish contact with the BSAA, the pair is told by O'Brien that Jill and Parker have now gone missing in the Mediterranean. Chris and Jessica are immediately redeployed, and the two make for the Queen Zenobia. 
Back on the ship, Jill and Parker come to and find that they're being held in separate rooms, but the two manage to make their way back to each other. As they head further into the ship and face all manner of horrors, they eventually chance across some crucial information. For starters, they discover what Il Veltro's goal is. The bioterrorism group intends to unleash the T-Abyss virus, which will in turn infect a huge chunk of the world's oceans. Meanwhile, they also find out that the T-Abyss virus was created by Il Veltro themselves, who plan to use it for revenge against the FBC, who were responsible for wiping out a large number of their forces during the Terra Grigia panic a year ago. Armed with this knowledge, Jill and Parker head for the Queen Zenobia's comm tower, where they intend to call for aid in hopes of being evacuated, but as soon as they arrive, they encounter another hurdle. It seems Morgan Lansdale, the head of the FBC, has activated the Regia Solis. And what exactly is that? Well, it's a solar-powered satellite that the FBC used to destroy the city of Terra Grigia a year ago, and that Lansdale now intends to use to destroy and sink the Queen Zenobia as well, thus erasing evidence of the FBC's involvement in the disastrous incident that led to the city's destruction, along with a few other things which we'll get into in just a bit. Jill and Parker attempt to use a UAV to stop the satellite attack, but though they are successful to some degree, their efforts are still not entirely effective, and the ship soon begins to flood. Chris and Jessica arrive on the Queen Zenobia around the same time, and they soon meet up with Jill and Parker. Soon afterward, they cross paths with a masked Il Veltro operative, and the ensuing conversation seems to hint at a larger conspiracy afoot. However, just as the operative is about to drop crucial information, he is shot by Jessica. His mask falls off, and he is revealed to be a man named Raymond Vester, who used to be Parker's old partner when both of them worked together at the FBC. Vester seemingly dies, before whispering something into Parker's ear. At this point, our four primary protagonists decide to split up into two groups again. Jill and Chris pair up and head to the lab in the ship to try and stop the T-Abyss virus from spreading into the sea, while Parker and Jessica together head to the Queen Zenobia's engine room to try to find a way to stop the ship from sinking. As the latter pair enters the engine room, Parker turns his gun on Jessica, having been told by Vester that she is an FBC mole. Oh, and Vester, as it turns out, is still alive thanks to a Kevlar vest, and is revealed to have been working with BSAA head Clive O'Brien. Jessica gets the upper hand on Parker, wounding him and triggering the ship's self-destruct sequence before fleeing from the scene. Meanwhile, as Chris and Jill arrive in the lab, they're contacted by Lansdale through a video uplink. Lansdale tells them that the FBC and Il Veltro actually worked together during the Terra Grigia panic, and that the whole thing had been orchestrated by him so that he could increase the FBC's funding and its legitimacy as an organization. Meanwhile, he also had his research team aboard the Queen Zenobia make a vaccine for the T-Abyss, and once they had delivered it to him, he had them killed as well. As the ship begins to explode and sink, Chris and Jill manage to successfully neutralize the virus before fleeing from the scene. The two climb onto a chopper piloted by BSA agent Kirk Matheson, but unfortunately, Parker is unable to escape. As he attempts to make it onto the chopper before the ship explodes, a catwalk breaks beneath his feet, sending him tumbling into a seemingly fiery death. Just not my night. Damn it! Good times, Jill. It was a nice ride. What? As Chris and Jill are escaping, they're contacted by O'Brien, who reveals that the Queen Zenobia mission was orchestrated by him so that he could get his hands on evidence that would incriminate Lansdale. Evidence that, of course, no longer exists, since Shura Watts, who was working for Lansdale, managed to blow the ship up. Meanwhile, O'Brien also informs the pair that there is another ship, the Queen Zenobia's sister ship, known as Queen Dido, beneath the ruins of Terra Grigia, where they might be able to find some evidence incriminating Lansdale. At this point, however, Lansdale has O'Brien arrested, cutting off his communications with Jill and Chris. The duo heads to the second ship regardless, where they find Jack Norman, the leader of Il Veltro. A fight ensues between them, in which an already infected Norman injects himself with an overdose of the T-Abyss virus, turning himself into a new kind of tyrant. 
During this encounter, however, he is also recorded by Chris and Jill as he talks about his work with the FBC, who then betrayed him. After successfully killing him following a grueling battle, the two of them broadcast the video. As the truth about Lansdale and the FBC's involvement in the Terra Grigia panic is made public, Lansdale is arrested, while O'Brien is set free. Though he, taking responsibility for his part in the Queen Zenobia mission, still steps down as the BSAA's director. Meanwhile, it is revealed that Parker didn't die and was rescued by Vester, and would soon go back to working with the BSAA. Meanwhile, Vester himself has an agenda of his own. Resident Evil Revelations post credit scene shows him meeting up with Jessica in a cafe, where he hands her a sample of the T Abyss virus, and cryptically tells her that he had his reasons for saving Parker. Resident Evil 5 might not have been the last game in the series, far from it, but it certainly felt like an ending. Major arcs came to their conclusion, the long-standing Chris-Wesker rivalry came to a head, and Wesker's whole story arc saw its dramatic resolution. Resident Evil 5 felt like the end of one phase for the series, and the beginning of another, paving the way for new stories, arcs, and characters, and so its importance in the series' overarching narrative cannot be overstated. It wouldn't be an exaggeration, in fact, to call it the most important game in the series as far as the story is concerned. And so, as we prepare to step into another new chapter in the series with Village coming out soon, we're going to pause and look back at this momentous installment and talk about its complete story from beginning to end. Resident Evil 5 takes place in the year 2009, but its events are kicked into motion three years before that. In 2006, Chris Redfield and Jill Valentine, now agents of the Bioterrorism Security Assessment Alliance, or BSAA, get a tip about the whereabouts of Umbrella Corporation co-founder Oswell Spencer, who has been on the run and hiding ever since knowledge of his company's true purpose and their activities went public years ago. Chris and Jill head to Spencer's estate, but much to their surprise, they find none other than Albert Wesker there, with Spencer lying dead at his feet. Chris and Jill take Wesker on, but as usual, they're no match for him. They're quickly overpowered, and just as it seems like Wesker is about to land a killing blow on Chris, Jill intervenes, tackling Wesker, throwing both him and herself out of a window and into the ravine below. The BSAA searches for both of them, but when neither is found, they're both declared dead, though Chris never fully accepts that his partner has met her demise. Fast forward to 2009 and the beginning of Resident Evil 5. Chris finds himself in West Africa with his new partner Sheva Alamar, and both of them have been tasked with investigating possible bioweapon smuggling activities in the area, with a man named Ricardo Irving their prime suspect. Chris and Sheva are to make contact with BSAA's Alpha Team in the area, but upon arrival they quickly realize that they've landed into a hornet's nest. The village they find themselves in has been overrun by people infected with Las Plagas Parasite, and Alpha Team has been murdered and entirely decimated by a B.O.W. created by a deadly new virus known as Ouroboros. The pair is eventually found and rescued by BSAA's Delta Team, led by Captain Josh Stone, who used to be Sheva's mentor. Stone shows the two of them the data that they have on bioterrorism activities in the area, but Chris finds something else that instantly grabs his attention a picture of Jill, who's been presumed dead at this point. Chris's belief that she is actually alive is fueled even further, of course, but we'll get back to her in a bit. Chris and Sheva get back on the trail of Ricardo Irving, and soon manage to track him down and corner him in a network of mines. He's aided, however, by the arrival of a mysterious hooded figure, who disrupts Chris and Sheva's attempts to apprehend Irving, and flees the scene with him. More ambushes and fights follow, including one particularly harrowing encounter with a bat-like B.O.W., which is also Ouroboros-based. Once they're out of the woods, they are contacted by the BSAA in order to return to headquarters to provide a full report of the situation. Chris, however, refuses to do so, now firmly believing that Jill is alive and connected to this whole mess. He decides to proceed with his original mission, and Sheva decides to help him. Eventually, the duo manages to catch up with Irving again while he tries to escape on a boat. Cornered by the two of them and left with no other option, in desperation, Irving injects himself with the Plagueis virus, turning himself into a massive sea monster, tentacles and all. Chris and Sheva manage to defeat him, following which Irving, in his final moments, tells them to head to a nearby cave to find the answers that they're looking for. He also suggests that one of the masterminds of this whole situation is Excella Gione, the head of the West African division of a pharmaceutical company named Tricell, who also happens to be one of BSAA's funders. 
Irving dies before he can elaborate any further, and Chris and Sheva head to the cave he mentioned. In the cave, they discover a flower known as the Stairway of the Sun, which, as it turns out, was what Umbrella originally used to create the progenitor virus, and in turn, all the viruses and bioweapons they created afterwards. In plain terms, this flower is the root cause of most of the terrible bioweapons and viruses that have made appearances throughout the history of Resident Evil. Something else they find is an old lab of umbrellas, which has since been taken over by Tricell, who are continuing the former's research. Within the lab, Chris and Sheva discover thousands of pods with human test subjects in them, but one of them, bearing the name Jill Valentine, is empty. Chris, who's already dogged in his search for his old partner, grows even more determined. More importantly, it's also revealed that Excella is indeed behind the outbreak of Ouroboros and all the Plaga-infected people Chris and Sheva have encountered. That said, she isn't the mastermind. And who is the mastermind? Well, of course, it's the man who's always the mastermind. You guessed it, Albert Wesker. No, he still isn't dead. Excella has been working with Wesker, who plans to unleash Ouroboros upon the entire world using missiles, to create a new and superior breed of humans. And he intends to rule over the chosen few that will manage to survive the impending apocalypse. Yeah, it's a bit much, but that's Wesker for you. Excella denies knowledge of Jill's survival and tells Chris that she doesn't know where she is. He doesn't believe her, of course, and together with Sheva, sets off in pursuit of her. Making it out of the lab and into a connected underground network of caves, Chris and Sheva come face to face with Wesker, who is accompanied by the mysterious hooded figure who had previously helped Irving escape. It's here that Wesker reveals the hooded figure to be none other than Jill. Brainwashed and mind-controlled by a device strapped to her, she has been an unwilling puppet of his. After hurling insults and humiliating Chris and Sheva with a good old-fashioned beating, he leaves, deciding he has more pressing matters to attend to, but leaves Jill behind. Chris obviously has no desire to fight Jill, but she herself has no control over her actions and proceeds to ferociously attack him and Sheva. The pair take her on in a tense fight and eventually manage to subdue her, following which they quickly remove the mind control device strapped to her. Slowly and finally coming to her senses, Jill urges Chris and Sheva to not waste any more time and go after Wesker and Excella, promising Chris that she'll be fine. Chris is reluctant to leave her alone, but ultimately relents. Wesker and Excella have boarded one of the ships belonging to the former, and Chris and Sheva manage to hop aboard as well. Not long afterward, they catch up with Excella once more, and though she manages to slip through their fingers and escape once again, she does end up dropping vials of an unknown serum to the ground in her haste. Sheva smartly scoops them up and keeps them, we'll get back to these in just a minute, and she and Chris resume their search for Excella and Wesker. As they're fighting their way through the tanker, however, Wesker does, well, what he always does. He betrays Excella, infecting her with Ouroboros, and declares that she was never more than a pawn in his grand scheme. Chris and Sheva take on her horrifying, mutated Ouroboros form in a tense fight, but by the time they manage to defeat her, Wesker has set his final plan into motion. He is preparing to board a bomber in the hangar of the tanker, which he will fly into the air and ultimately deploy Ouroboros-filled missiles with the intention of firing them all over the world. As Chris and Sheva hurry after him, Chris receives a call from Jill, who tells him that Wesker needs regular doses of a progenitor-based serum to keep the virus in him stable, which in turn allows him to retain his superhuman strength and speed. And yes, the serum she is talking about is the same one that Excella dropped, and that is now in Sheva's possession. Interestingly enough, Jill also tells them that an overdose of the same serum would kill Wesker. Turns out being a slave to Wesker's will has its advantages after all, because that information is going to be crucial in a bit. Chris and Sheva arrive at the hangar and take Wesker on. During the fight, Chris injects Wesker with an overdose of the serum, greatly weakening him, which forces Wesker to retreat and flee into his plane. As it's about to take off, however, Chris and Sheva hop on as well. Inside the plane, their fight continues, with Chris injecting Wesker with yet another dose of the serum. As the fight escalates out of control, the bomber crashes into an active volcano, but when Chris and Sheva hop off board, they see that the ever-so-stubborn Wesker still isn't dead. In a final act of desperation, Wesker infects himself with the Ouroboros from one of the missiles. The final stage of the fight sees Chris and Sheva battling against a heavily mutated Wesker as the volcano explodes around them. And yes, this is where Chris repeatedly punches a boulder, forever setting his legacy in stone. 
Eventually, the ground cracks beneath Wesker, swallowing him whole and sending him into the lava underneath. Josh Stone and Jill arrive on the scene in a BSAA chopper, which Chris and Sheva promptly get on. Wesker, who just doesn't know how to take a hint, still hasn't given up though, and grabs hold of the chopper with a massive and mutated arm. Deciding that enough is enough, Chris and Sheva fire an RPG into his face, killing him once and for all, irrevocably. For real this time, at least so far anyways. As Wesker's corpse burns up in the volcano, Chris, Sheva, and Jill fly away in the chopper, bringing to a close Wesker's constant schemes and manipulations, his long-standing rivalry with Chris, and of course, the story of Resident Evil 5. We've spent the last few weeks doing recaps of the stories of all Resident Evil games, having done one just recently for the first Resident Evil Revelations. There's one more game left though, Resident Evil Revelations 2, which serves as both a sequel to Revelations and a stopgap between the events of Resident Evil 5 and 6, bridging the two of them together. Here we'll be talking about its full story from start to finish. Resident Evil Revelations 2 features two separate storylines. One focuses on Claire Redfield, and the other, set six months after Claire's story, features Barry Burton. As the game begins, we find that Claire is a senior member of the anti-bioterrorism organization known as the TerraSave, and that her new partner is none other than Moira Burton, the older daughter of Barry. Moira, as we learn later on in the game, has a crippling fear of guns due to an accident in her childhood when she and her sister Polly managed to get their hands on one of her father's guns, resulting in Moira actually shooting her sister. Even though Barry now realizes that the fault was his own, for the longest time he blamed Moira for the incident, putting immense strain on the relationship between the two. Revelations 2's opening scenes show Claire and Moira at a gathering for the TerraSave members, but the event is cut short in a predictably disastrous fashion when a group of masked soldiers attacks them, knocking them out and taking them captive. When Claire and Moira wake up, they find themselves inside of a ramshackle prison that is overrun by creatures known as the Afflicted, who used to be humans but have mutated heavily due to torturous experiments, which we'll get to in a bit. Both of them have bracelets attached to both of their hands, and they're contacted through the bracelet by a woman's voice, who calls herself the Overseer, and tells them that these bracelets track and record their fear. Claire and Moira manage to make their way out of the prison, and when they do, they discover that the prison is located on an isolated island. Soon they arrive at a nearby settlement called Wasek, where they find more abducted TerraSave members, and it's revealed why exactly they were all brought here. The Overseer contacts them again, telling them that they're all her new test subjects for a new bioweapon known as the t Phobos virus, which, as its name suggests, responds to the fear of whoever has been injected with it. And how exactly does it respond to their fear? Why, turning them into mutated monstrosities, of course. Almost immediately afterward, the group is attacked by a swarm of the afflicted and the other TerraSave members that Claire and Moira found are eventually killed, either in the current attack or not long afterward. All but one, Neil Fisher, who is in fact the leader of TerraSave. While Fisher stays behind to fight the monsters, Claire and Moira use the time he's bought for them to make their escape. They cross paths with a mysterious young girl named Natalia Corda, who, as the game eventually reveals, is an orphan and lost both her parents in the Terra Griga incident that led to the events of the first Revelations game. These traumas in her past have made her almost immune to fear, which makes her oddly suited to being on an island that is brimming with B.O.W.s and a virus that responds first and foremost to fear. Natalia is soon abducted, however, captured by a hooded figure who takes her to the Overseer's tower on the island, with the Overseer intending to transfer her consciousness into the little girl's body. Claire and Moira give chase, of course, and after getting past a bunch of dangerous traps and making their way through a deadly network of sewers, they arrive at their destination where they make some startling revelations. The Overseer, as it turns out, is a woman named Alex Wesker, the so-called sister of Albert Wesker himself, and was one of the children that were part of Umbrella's Project Wesker Eugenics Program. Meanwhile, Neil Fisher, the leader of TerraSave, is a mole of the organization known as the FBC, which was disbanded when its leader, Morgan Lansdale, was arrested when knowledge of his involvement in the Terra Griga incident became public. Fisher has been working with Wesker with a deal in place that will give him a sample of the Ouroboros virus, which in turn he intends to use to restore the FBC. But Alex Wesker does justice to her name. She betrays Fisher, and instead of giving him the Ouroboros sample in exchange for bringing her Natalia, she injects him with it and flees the scene. Fisher turns into a hulking, mutated monstrosity, and Claire and Moira are forced to engage him in a fight, which ends with Moira killing him after finally overcoming her lifelong fear of guns. 
Once the fight is over, Claire and Moira go after Alex, who tells them that their ultimate goal is to overcome fear. Much to the surprise of the two of them, however, Alex proceeds to shoot herself in the head, seemingly killing herself. The facility that they're in responds to Alex's death by triggering a self-destruct sequence, forcing Claire and Moira to escape. Moira is caught under falling debris during their escape, however, and forces Claire to leave, who jumps into the ocean, leaving Moira behind. Claire wakes up in the hospital where she finds Barry Burton. When questioned about his daughter, Claire informs him that Moira dies, which Barry refuses to believe. No, Moira isn't dead. We'll get to that in a bit. Now we get to the Barry part of the story. Set six months after Claire's story, we see Barry heading to the island in search of Moira. And almost as soon as he arrives, however, he finds Natalia, and seeing the little girl all alone, he decides to take her under his wing. Soon afterward, the two of them also discover that Alex Wesker isn't dead after all, surprise, and has instead mutated due to the t virus into a hulking monstrosity. Their trek across the island sees them going through many trials and tribulations and facing many dangers and ends with a confrontation with Alex. In true Wesker fashion, and undergoes a second transformation, turning into something even more hideous and horrifying. At this point, you can get one of two endings in the game. But for obvious reasons, we're only going to talk about the canon one. In the fight that ensues, Barry is incapacitated by Alex, who then grabs Natalia and is moments away from killing her. In the nick of time, Moira, who has been surviving on the island for the past six months, arrives helping Barry and Natalia fight Alex off. The three of them escape from the facility they're fighting in, while Alex, after transforming once again, chases them through the island. Claire arrives on the scene right in time in a helicopter, using a sniper rifle from a distance to fight Alex off while Barry, Moira, and Natalia climb on board. Finally, just as Chris Redfield once used a rocket launcher to conclusively kill a heavily mutated Albert Wesker, so too does Claire fire off an RPG as their chopper flies away to kill the heavily mutated Alex. In the game's epilogue, just as Chris Redfield is preparing to deploy to China to combat the sea virus threat portrayed in Resident Evil 6, Claire visits the Burton residence. Barry has adopted Natalia and intends to raise her as his daughter, though things might not proceed as planned. In the final moments of Resident Evil Revelations 2, it is heavily implied that Alex Wesker succeeded in her plan of transferring her consciousness into Natalia, who it seems is beginning to be overtaken by the resurgent Alex. Resident Evil's story may have started out fairly simple and straightforward two and a half decades ago, but as time has gone on, it's become more and more convoluted. With Resident Evil 6, the series touched never-before-seen heights of ridiculousness and nonsense insanity. Though it tried to raise the stakes higher than ever with a globe-trotting story and four separate campaigns focusing on different characters who would often cross paths with each other, it escalated things a bit too much, and the only thing it ended up doing was telling a confusing, muddled tale. Either way, over the last few weeks and months, we have been going through the franchise bit by bit as we recount its entire story, and now it's time for Resident Evil 6. So here, we're going to go over its full story, from beginning to end. Buckle up, because this will be a bumpy one. Our story begins in December 2012, in a Civil War-torn Eastern European state known as Edonia. Jake Muller is a hardened mercenary despite his young age, and makes his living fighting for Edonian rebels. The status quo quickly shifts, however, when a new medicine starts doing the rounds here. Brought by a mysterious woman who claims that the medicine is a nutritional supplement, it turns out after everyone has taken it that it was actually a bioweapon. Everyone is infected and transformed into monsters, but Jake mysteriously remains unaffected. As everyone around him loses their mind and the situation erupts into chaos, Jake is contacted by a young woman who works as an agent for the United States Department of Security Operations, Sherry Birkin, who was once a young, helpless girl who had to be rescued from Raccoon City years ago by Leon S. Kennedy and Claire Redfield, but has now become a trained agent. Sherry tells Jake that the bioweapon that was released in Edonia is called the C-Virus, released by a bioterrorist group calling itself Neo Umbrella, and that curiously enough, Jake seems to be immune to its effects. And since he carries antibodies, he may be the key to the vaccine. Jake agrees to help Sherry make a vaccine, but being a mercenary doesn't do so until she agrees to make a hefty cash payment to him when the job is done. Together, Jake and Sherry make their escape, but as they're attempting to flee from Edonia, Neo Umbrella unleashes a deadly, monstrous new bioweapon known as Ustanak, or as series fans like to call him, Mr. Knockoff Nemesis. 
Ustanak, focused solely on finding and killing Jake, pursues him and Sherry as they make their escape, hellbent on stopping them. During the chase, they cross paths with none other than Chris Redfield, and with their help, manage to get away. How the hell did Chris even get here, though? Well, we'll get to that in just a bit. Jake and Sherry manage to find their way into a helicopter, but Ustanak is nothing if not persistent. Though it's unable to kill them, it does damage the chopper heavily, and though Jake and Sherry narrowly manage to jump out before it crashes, a piece of the chopper breaks off during the chaos, rips their parachute to shreds, and causes them to take a deep tumble. Now, let's pause for a bit. Chris Redfield, how the hell did he end up in Edonia? Well, he's a decorated soldier and an agent of the BSAA, so when the organization gets wind of the bioterrorism attack in Edonia, naturally it's Chris who leads a squad out to Eastern Europe to deal with the situation. Also among his squad is Piers Nivens, an up-and-comer who shows a lot of promise. After helping Jake and Sherry escape from Ustanak, Chris and his squad successfully break into the Neo Umbrella facility close by, where, surprisingly enough, they find everyone's favorite spy and quintuplet agent, Ada Wong. Apparently, she's a prisoner here, held captive by Neo Umbrella. But as Chris and his squad begin the process of extracting her from the facility, it turns out that she was much more than that. She was using herself as bait, and the trap she had laid for the BSAA squad has now been sprung. She infects almost the entire squad with the C-Virus, turning them into monstrous creatures. Chris and Piers are the only ones who survive, and the two are forced to gun down their fellow soldiers. Chris sustains heavy injuries during the chaos, and only narrowly manages to make it out alive thanks to Piers. Let's get one thing out of the way right now. Resident Evil 6 takes its sweet time revealing this stuff, but we're going to talk about it right here to avoid any confusion, and, you know, for convenience sake. The Ada Wong Chris and company find here is not the real Ada Wong. She's Carla Radames, the lead researcher for Neo Umbrella, who secretly works for Derek Simmons, the national security advisor to the United States President, Adam Binford. So how exactly did she turn into an Ada Wong clone? Well, simply put, Simmons was obsessed with Ada and forcefully transformed Carla into an Ada clone by injecting her with a blend of Ada's DNA and the C-Virus. Yeah, it makes no sense, but that's RE6 for you. Anyway, we'll get to Simmons later. Following the events in Edonia, Chris goes into a self-imposed amnesiac exile for the next six months. And again, we'll get to that in a bit. For now, let's get back to Jake and Sherry. Though Jake managed to escape their crash landing relatively unscathed, Sherry incurred a serious injury. But remember how she was infected with the G-Virus during the events of Resident Evil 2 all those years ago? A virus that, among many other things, gives the person it infects self-healing abilities? Yeah, well, Sherry still carries that virus inside of her, and thanks to that, the injuries she sustained during the crash landing heal by themselves in no time. The two find little time to rest, however. They're attacked once again by C-virus-infected monsters, while Ustanak also continues to doggedly pursue them. Though they manage to escape narrowly time and again, eventually they are surrounded by Neo Umbrella's forces and caught by Carla Radames. She informs Jake that he is the illegitimate child of none other than Albert Wesker, which, as it turns out, is how he is immune to the C-Virus. Neo Umbrella takes Jake and Sherry captive, taking them to the organization's facility in Lanxiang, China, where the two of them are subject to experiments for the next six months. And yes, now we jump forward six months to June 2013. But before we get back to Chris and Piers and Jake and Sherry, we need to talk about Leon S. Kennedy, who is another crucial part of RE6's story. Now an agent of the Division of Security Operations, Leon's story in Resident Evil 6 picks up in the American city of Tall Oaks. Here, President Adam Benford plans on making confidential details about the destruction of Raccoon City in 1998 public as he prepares to kickstart his new policies for the global war against bioterrorism. As it turns out, however, his plans never kick into motion. Tall Oaks becomes ground zero for a deadly bioterror attack. The C-Virus is unleashed in the university campus where Leon and the president currently are, and nearly everyone there is turned into zombified monstrosities, including the president. Leon sees the mutated president attacking United States Secret Service agent Helena Harper, and reluctantly, he is forced to shoot and kill Binford. Immediately, Helena tells Leon that she is the one who is responsible for this attack, but refuses to unveil any more information. She tells him that she needs to get to the Tall Oaks Cathedral, and once Leon has helped her get there, she will tell him the whole story. Though Leon is obviously mistrustful, he does agree. 
the pair make their way through Tall Oaks, which, as it turns out, has turned into a modern-day Raccoon City. The whole city has been infected with the sea virus and blanketed in complete chaos. Leon and Helena eventually reach the cathedral and then enter a mysterious lab underneath it, where it is revealed why Helena had brought them there, to find her sister Deborah. As it turns out, Derek Simmons, who we spoke of earlier, had abducted Deborah and was holding her hostage. He forced Helena to work for him, and in turn, used her to engineer the bioterror attacks on Tall Oaks. What's worse, it turns out that Deborah is past saving at this point. Leon and Helena arrive too late, and when they do, Deborah turns into a hideously mutated B.O.W., and Helena is forced to kill her. During their fight with the mutated Deborah, however, they are also aided by Ada Wong, who also happens to be there on the scene, who is currently on the hunt for the fake Ada clone, aka Carla Radames, who is being paraded around, which of course does not sit right with the real Ada. Once the fight is done, Helena tells Leon that Simmons used her to infect and assassinate the president. Simmons, as it happens, was the one who engineered Raccoon City's destruction in 1998, and he also has other larger plans in motion that will make that incident look tame in comparison. Meanwhile, Ada informs Leon and Helena that Simmons is also the head of a group known as The Family, who are a massively wealthy shadow organization and have been involved in pulling the strings of global politics for their own gain for years. After this, Ada leaves, since she has her own mission that she's on. Leon and Helena, meanwhile, come in contact with Simmons, who tells them that the blame for the president's death has been placed on the two of them. And though it's he himself who framed them, he tells them that if they turn themselves in, he will help clear their names. The two obviously refuse, and with the help of fellow U.S. agent Ingrid Hannigan, who's also a longtime associate of Leon's, they fake their deaths. Why exactly do they do that? Well, because as it turns out, Simmons has now orchestrated another bioterror attack in Lenshang, China. Leon and Helena, determined to put a stop to his machinations, head to China while Tall Oaks is blown to bits by a missile strike behind them, calling back to the destruction of Raccoon City. Now it's time to pause once again and catch up with Chris Redfield. Six months ago, his team was decimated, and he himself was gravely injured in the incident in Edonia. Since then, Chris has then suffered PTSD-afflicted amnesia. Yeah, he's not doing well, and he doesn't even remember why. Again, RE6 tries to make a big deal out of his amnesia, but like many other plot points in the series, it never really goes anywhere. So why don't we just save ourselves some time here? He eventually recovers his memory, and it only takes a couple of chapters of his story for him to get to that point. Big surprise. Anyway, Chris's story picks back up six months after the Edonia incident in Eastern Europe. His memories are currently gone, and he's taken a step back from his BSAA duties, obviously, but he's soon pulled back into the action. His former fellow BSA agent, Piers Nivens, arrives on the scene and informs Chris about what's going on in China. Chris is obviously reluctant to go, but a combination of Piers' insistence and the hope that fighting against bioterrorism in China will bring back his memories leads him to finally relent and agree to leading a BSAA squad in Lanxiang. So now all our heroes are in China, and this is where we go back to Jake and Sherry. The two have been prisoners in Neo Umbrella's China facility for six months, but due to convenient circumstances, they both manage to find a way to escape. They break out of the facility and, pursued by Neo Umbrella's forces, make a run for it through the streets of Lenshang. Eventually, they run into none other than Leon and Helena. A conversation between the two pairs leads to several revelations. Sherry tells Leon that Derek Simmons is her boss, but Leon informs her that this whole mess has been caused by Simmons. Sherry and Leon have a history, of course. He saved her life back in Raccoon City, after all, so naturally, she trusts him. She tells Leon and Helena where to find Simmons, and promises to meet up with him at the rendezvous point. As Leon and Helena are making their way to the location, they chance across Ada Wong, whose personal mission to destroy the project that led to the creation of her clone and to take Carla Radames out of the equation has brought her to China as well. Leon and Helena try to communicate with her, but the situation goes quickly out of control. For starters, this isn't the real Ada after all, it's her clone, Carla. On top of that, Chris, as it turns out, has fully recovered his memories at this point and he's on full tilt. He's single-mindedly pursuing Ada, unaware that it was actually Carla who killed his team. And just as Leon and Helena are trying to get information out of Carla, Chris and Piers arrive on the scene as well. Things quickly get heated. 
Chris is determined to kill the woman he thinks is Ada, but Leon won't have it. He tells Chris that it's not her, but Simmons who is responsible for everything that's going on, and soon enough, the two of them are pointing their guns at each other. In this confusion, Carla manages to slip past them and escape. Leon manages to talk Chris down, and the two pairs part ways once again. Leon and Helena go after Simmons, while Chris and Piers run after Carla. Let's go ahead and stick with Leon and Helena for now. They arrive at Simmons' location around the same time that Sherry and Jake do, and here, Simmons openly admits that he was responsible for everything that's happened, but that he did it in the name of global stability, which translates to ensuring that his shadow organization, the family, retains its dominance and wealth. The situation quickly turns violent, as Simmons, now infected with the C-Virus, transforms into a giant BOW, which looks an awful lot like a T-Rex because that's just the sort of game that Resident Evil 6 is. Leon and Helena take him on, while Jake and Sherry make their escape. The latter pair, however, is quickly overpowered by several infected monstrosities, and once again, they are taken captive. While this is going on, Chris and Piers have been chasing after Carla through the streets of China. They eventually corner her aboard an aircraft carrier, where Carla, who Chris and Piers still think is Ada, reveals her plan. She plans to fire a missile loaded with the C virus over Lanshang to become a global outbreak of the virus, recreating the Raccoon City incident, but on a much, much larger scale, since from here, the virus will spread all over the world. As it turns out, Carla is acting against Simmons as well. Tortured by the experiments he did on her to turn her into an Ada Wong clone, her personality has been resurfacing over time, and she intends to use the C virus as a global weapon to destroy everything that Simmons and the family have worked for. Just as she is about to launch the missile, however, a chopper arrives on the scene, from where a sniper, working for the family, shoots Carla through the chest. Injured, she falls off the aircraft carrier to her apparent death. Chris and Piers are relieved the missile strike didn't go through, but their relief is short-lived. Carla, as it turns out, was one step ahead again. The missile reactivates and launches, explodes in the air, and envelops the city in a C-virus gas. By this time, Leon and Helena have managed to defeat the T-Rex known as Simmons, apparently killing him, but not really, of course, and more on this in a bit. Soon afterward, they are contacted by Chris, who informs them of the missile strike, telling them to evacuate the city immediately. Leon, however, realizes that there's still a way out of this mess. Jake carries C-virus antibodies, which can be used to make a vaccine. He tells Chris that Jake and Sherry have been taken captive and need to be rescued, since Jake is the key to humanity's survival. Chris and Piers agree to head to Neo Umbrella's undersea facility for the rescue operation, while Leon and Helena try to flee from the city. As they're doing so, they are attacked once again by Simmons, who is not dead after all, and has mutated even further. During their desperate fight against him, they are aided by Ada Wong, and are finally able to kill him for good. Ada mysteriously vanishes from the scene immediately afterward, while Leon and Helena board a chopper and flee from the city. Ada, meanwhile, manages to find all of Carla's research and destroys it completely before leaving the city for her next mysterious assignment as well. Which means two of the four campaigns still need wrapping up, but we're almost there. Chris and Piers arrive at the undersea Neo Umbrella facility and manage to find Jake and Sherry. Chris and Jake almost come to blows when the former reveals that he was the one who killed Albert Wesker, but that's just RE6 being dramatic for no reason again. The dramatic confrontation is interrupted when they are attacked by a massive C-virus infected BOW called House. House, as it turns out, was created by Carla Radames as her ultimate weapon and has the ability to spread the C-virus by itself. If it manages to make it to the surface, the situation will get a whole lot worse. Chris and Piers engage House in a fight, while Jake and Sherry make a run for it. House proves to be too much for them to handle though. The BOW mortally wounds Piers, while Chris also sustains serious injuries. But just as the two of them are on the verge of being killed, in a final act of desperation, Piers injects himself with the C-Virus. He undergoes a deadly transformation, and using his newfound powers, manages to subdue House. Knowing that he's not going to stick around for much longer, he forces Chris into an escape pod, and as Chris leaves the facility, he helplessly watches on as Piers sacrifices himself, destroying the facility in a final act of heroism. Meanwhile, Jake and Sherry are stopped by none other than Ustanak, 
The two of them take the BOW on in a final, grueling fight, but ultimately they are able to finally kill it for good, before escaping from the facility. Jake hands Sherry a sample of his blood and heads off on his own. Meanwhile, a vaccine is made from his blood and used to slowly curb the C-Virus threat completely. And that's it. That's the messy, unnecessary, and not really all that interesting story of Resident Evil 6. From a cheap nemesis knockoff to Albert Wesker's illegitimate son suddenly emerging from nowhere. From an Ada Wong clone to a terrible villain who at one point turns into a dinosaur. From a super agent Sherry Birkin to a Chris Redfield who has amnesia for like a minute, RE6's story was a complete and utter mess. Thankfully, if you've watched this video, at least you no longer have to play or replay the game, so <laughs> that's something. Resident Evil took an almost clean break from its long and winding overarching narrative when it reinvented itself with RE7 in 2017. But now that the series is well and truly back on track, we're expecting the upcoming Resident Evil Village to have a lot more connections to the series' larger narrative. Even so, this is still a direct continuation of Resident Evil 7 first and foremost, with Ethan Winters returning as protagonist and the game's story picking up where the previous one left off. As such, with our incursions into Village almost upon us, here we're going to take a look back at the entire story of RE7. Resident Evil 7 takes place in 2017, with plain old vanilla guy Ethan Winters taking the role of the primary protagonist. For three years, he believed his wife to be dead, after she suddenly went missing on what she claimed was just another plain old babysitting job. That all changes though, when out of nowhere she contacts him again to let him know that she's still alive, asking him to come get her at a place called the Baker Residence in the bayous of Dolvay, Louisiana. Now, obviously, Ethan drops everything and heads straight there. The Baker residence, however, is no place for anyone to be. As soon as Ethan arrives on the scene, he's met with unpleasant scenes, to say the very least. The house is run down and decaying. Its owners are nowhere to be seen. In fact, according to the locals, they've been missing for some time, and their house haunted. Meanwhile, as Ethan enters into the house through its back entrance, he sees everything from parts of dead animals strung up in the swamps to a dead crow in the microwave in the house itself. Shortly after making it into the house, Ethan manages to find Mia, and though she is, much to his surprise, alive and well, it's clear to him that something is very wrong. She's incoherent, babbling about her daddy and how they're going to be a family, and it's plain as day that she's been through the grinder in the time that she's been dead to the outside world. And the circumstances have definitely had a terrifying effect on her, for reasons Ethan doesn't understand yet. Mia suddenly becomes violent while the two of them are attempting to find a way out of her house, forcing Ethan to take her on in a fight. The fight, however, does not go very well for him, with a freakishly strong Mia stabbing him in the hand with a screwdriver, throwing him through a wall, and even chopping off one of his hands with a chainsaw. Ethan finally manages to kill her in self-defense, but not really, and more on that in a bit, but he doesn't get very far after that. He's immediately ambushed by a man who welcomes him to the family and knocks him out with a punch to the face. When Ethan comes to, he realizes that things have only gone from bad to worse for him. His hand has somehow managed to be reattached to his body, but he's been tied to a chair and sitting at a dinner table, surrounded by the most deranged scene he could possibly imagine. Around the table is sitting the Baker family, the patriarch Jack Baker, his wife Marguerite, their son Lucas, and an old woman in a wheelchair, and all of them seem to be enjoying a meal of human flesh and organs. Soon after Ethan regains consciousness, the Bakers try force-feeding him the disgusting food as well, but are interrupted when they hear a doorbell at the house. Jack and Lucas presume it's a cop that's apparently been troubling them for some time now, and the Bakers all leave the scene to deal with the situation. Ethan takes the opportunity to free himself, and soon comes into contact with Zoe Baker, the daughter of the Baker family. Conversing with her over the phone, which is something that happens quite a lot throughout this game, he learns that the Bakers have apparently been infected with something that's not only turning them into the monstrous and hostile beasts he's seeing now, but also giving them superpowered abilities, as well as the ability to quickly regenerate, making them incredibly hard to kill. The same virus that has infected the Bakers has, in fact, also spewed black gooey monstrosities all over their estate, called the Molded. Zoe tells Ethan that there is a serum that can be used to cure both herself and Mia, who, yes, is still alive. And then if Ethan can find the components required to formulate the serum, he'll be able to help both women and get out of the Baker residence, and far away from this entire nightmare. 
Naturally, Ethan agrees to do just that, and sets about looking for a way out of the house and for the aforementioned components. Over the course of the next few hours of Resident Evil 7, Ethan manages to make his way through the madhouse, facing many trials and tribulations. On top of coming up against a plethora of molded, he also faces off against Jack Baker multiple times, each time managing to come out victorious by the skin of his teeth. Each time, though, Jack seemingly dies, only to come back stronger and more deformed later on. Ethan also takes on Marguerite, who, thanks to her infection, has the ability to spawn and summon swarms of massive bugs, and after a grueling encounter with her, Ethan manages to put her down for good. Eventually, Ethan manages to recover the components required to craft the serum, but he still faces yet another hurdle, when Lucas captures Zoe and Mia. Ethan is forced to participate in a deranged, escape room-style game put together by Lucas, full of deadly traps and hazards, but successfully gets through it with his life. He and Lucas never face off against each other, though, with the latter fleeing from the scene as soon as he realizes that he's failed in trying to kill Ethan. When Ethan finally encounters Zoe and Mia, he has two serums with him, but not for long. He's attacked by a hideously deformed and mutated Jack Baker one last time, and during that fight, to put him down once and for good, he injects him with the serum, seemingly killing him for good this time. Of course, he isn't dead, more on that in a bit. Now, with just one serum in hand, Ethan faces a tough decision, will he cure Mia or Zoe? The game does let the player make the decision here, with some things being affected based on that choice, but let's just go with what's canon for the purposes of this recap. Ethan cures Mia, promises Zoe that he'll send someone back for her, and together, husband and wife escape the Baker residence on a boat. Before we get any further, it's time to pause and take a trip down memory lane and explain exactly how the hell everything that's been going on even started. Well, for starters, where did this virus and the molded all come from? Well, seeing as this is Resident Evil, after all, they came from a bioweapon. This bioweapon, created by a crime syndicate known as The Connections, was engineered in a lab and given the appearance of a small girl. From mind control to spewing out large quantities of the molded, this girl, named Evelyn, and given the designation E-001 by her creators, had no shortage of terrifying abilities. Evelyn was not without, well, let's call them manufacturing defects. For starters, her mental state was highly unstable, which meant she was often desperately seeking out familial connections, and tended to use her abilities to force people into believing that they were her family. Seeing as she had been artificially aged to take on the appearance of a 10-year-old girl, she also required regular doses of chemicals from her creators to maintain a stable physical form. Not long after her creation, fearing theft or sabotage from their competitors, the Connections tasked two of their agents to take Evelyn to one of their secret labs in Central America. As it turns out, one of those two agents was none other than Mia herself, whose babysitting jobs had always been little more than a front for her true nature as an agent of the Connections. Three years ago, she was traveling with Evelyn and fellow Connections agent Alan Droney on a tanker called the Annabelle, under the cover of a couple and their daughter. Their voyage was interrupted by a hurricane, though, during which Evelyn unleashed her powers, destroyed the ship, and killed everyone on board other than herself and Mia. The ship wound up crashing in the swamps of Dolve, Louisiana, where the two of them were found and taken in by the Baker family, who of course had no idea what they had just signed up for back then. Over the course of the next three years, under Evelyn's influence, they would go on to abduct and kill dozens upon dozens of people. Evelyn herself, meanwhile, continued to age rapidly, and though she did eventually manage to stabilize her physical form herself, by the time she did so, she had taken on the form of a feeble old woman in a wheelchair. At some point during these three years, Lucas Baker was also contacted by the Connections, who immunized him against Evelyn's control in exchange for providing observations about her. While Evelyn remained under the impression that Lucas was still under her control, Lucas quickly rose through the ranks as researcher for the Connections, but again, we'll get back to that in a bit. Alright, so back to the present now. Ethan and Mia may have gotten on a boat, but they didn't get very far. Soon they came across the wreckage of the tanker Annabelle and are immediately attacked by Evelyn's molded. Their boat crashes, with the two of them washing up to the ship's wreckage. And Ethan is taken captive by the molded. The next section of the game is spent playing as Mia, as she makes her way through the ship looking for Ethan and getting back her memories of what went down on the ship, including much of what we've already talked about. After recovering a tissue sample of Evelyn, Mia manages to find and rescue Ethan. 
Handing him the sample, she tells him to go back to the Baker residence and kill Evelyn once and for all, while she stays behind to try and fight off Evelyn's attempts to bring her back under her control. After making his way through a network of tunnels in nearby salt mines, Ethan makes it back to the Baker house, where he comes face to face with Evelyn, injecting her with a necrotoxin composed using the tissue sample Mia gave her. In a final, desperate attempt to bring the situation back in her control, Evelyn undergoes a final transformation, turning massive and monstrous and absorbing all of the mold around her to essentially swallow the entire Baker house. As Ethan takes her on one last time, a squad of soldiers led by none other than Chris Redfield himself intervenes. They drop a high-powered weapon from their helicopter, which Ethan uses to kill Evelyn once and for all. Afterward, Ethan and Mia are rescued by the new arrivals and are seen flying away in the final scene of the game. But wait, there's more. Resident Evil 7 also has two major DLCs that reveal some pretty important information. For starters, who the hell is this military group being led by Chris Redfield? Well, it's Blue Umbrella. As its name suggests, several members of the former Umbrella Corporation were formed as a PMC, with their sole intent being to clean up the messes left behind by their former company, and fighting against bioterrorism however they can. Chris Redfield, still a BSAA agent, has teamed up with Blue Umbrella on a temporary basis because their goals are aligned. And, well, what are their goals? putting a stop to the E-001 bioweapon and investigating the connections. In the Not A Hero DLC, once Ethan and Mia have been safely flown away, Chris sets out in the salt mines close to the Baker estate to look for Lucas Baker, who he knows to be an agent of the connections, and is their best and only lead on the criminal organization. What they don't know, however, is that Lucas has gone rogue. He's killed several of his fellow researchers and aims to steal all of the data on Evelyn in the mold and sell it to the highest bidder. Chris manages to put a stop to his machinations though, killing Lucas in the nick of time and managing to stop him from transferring that data to an unknown third party. There's also the end of Zoe DLC, which involves, as its name suggests, Zoe Baker, who is found in the swamps by her uncle, Joe Baker, Jack's brother, who's been living in the swamps as a hermit for many years. Curiously enough, Jack Baker still isn't dead and has transformed into a monstrosity known as the Swamp Man. End of Zoe follows Joe's attempts to cure Zoe and protect her from the Swamp Man, with it all culminating in a battle between the two brothers, with Joe finally killing Jack once and for all. For real this time. Zoe and Joe are both found by Blue Umbrella soldiers and Chris Redfield, who's been informed about her situation by Ethan. And that's it! That's the full story of Resident Evil 7 and its DLCs. Resident Evil Village will see Ethan Winters taking center stage once again, while Mia and Chris will also be returning. Something weird is going on though, with Chris seemingly having shot and killed Mia and kidnapped Ethan and Mia's infant daughter, forcing Ethan to set off on another nightmarish adventure. There are several plot threads from RE7 that are yet unresolved, while Village itself is also bringing in entirely new mysteries of its own, so there should be quite a meaty story to look forward to. With the game launching on May 7th, thankfully we do not have to wait too long to experience all of it. And that brings us to the end of the video. A quick request before we conclude. We upload new videos every single day, and if you like what we're doing, please consider subscribing. It really, really helps us out. Also, don't forget to enable all notifications by clicking the bell icon so that you can receive daily video updates. Thanks for watching.